Hello, everybody in live Facebook land, all our Matarata World fans, Matarata GP fans, everyone who's going to join in. We're going to give you a couple of minutes just to get yourself sorted. We're just waiting for tonight's guest, and I'm hoping he's got his times right because I've sent him WhatsApps and then and he's, uh, I don't know if he seems to be a bit confused in that, but we're going to wait for him. It is, of course, Mr. Simon Crayfar, and joining me to interview or talk to the man is, of course, Mr. Donovan Free. Don, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm okay, mate. It's a nice and freezing cold this time of year. What the hell? It is. <laughs> As you can see, like I'm all, yeah, like I'm all nice and tucked up and warm. I see you sending me a recording audio, so let's see what Simon has to say. Buddy, you're going to think I'm a right retard. I read it as Wednesday night and uh, put it on my calendar <laughs> for Wednesday night. So we're just rushing around now getting it hooked up. I was totally disorganized. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Okay, so just to clarify, can people hear me? Because I have no idea what's going on. It all froze up, and now it's uh, now it's just me sitting here. Can you hear me? Somebody say you can hear me. There's a bit of a delay there. Hey, there we go. Stephen Berry, I'll save you. Hi, Don. Yes, I don't know where Rob's gone now. Uh, I think he's got internet problems. Uh, I'm out here in Hot Beersport at the moment, and I am sitting. So I'm sitting in the middle of the sticks, and for some reason, my internet works. And yet, uh, Rob's sitting in Boxburg, uh, and it is it does not work. And he's got some special new cable that he plugs in. Anyway, maybe he's talking to Simon backstage. Who knows? But uh, he should be back soon. Uh, yeah, Rob's Wi-Fi. Otherwise, I'll just like answer whatever you guys say. Say stuff. Come on, people. Uh, Trevor Fitchett, Yes, I can hear. Uh, Andre Moritz. How's a man? Um, Taryn, he shaved so he disappeared. Must be. It's like Samson's hair. <laughs> uh, John Fernandez over a cliff somewhere. <laughs> uh, John runs a bottle store. So when uh, alcohol goes up on sale, everyone must go to John Fernandez's bottle store. Uh, Chazelle, where's Simon? Um, yeah, there's been a bit of confusion. He's running around somewhere. Uh, hopefully they'll be back soon. Uh, people saying stuff. Who's a Gareth Hope Bailey stuff? There we go. <laughs> Vickers Albert's Frankie stuff. Uh, Chazelle, where's Simon? He's coming. Uh, who else says Basil Jacob says stuff? This is easy. I just read what people write. Down to Simon with a race winner. <laughs> Can you believe it? There we go. I think we've got a Rob back. Let's see. Rob, you're back, oh, yeah. mate. You left me. I am back. It, it, awesome. it, it hit an error code and it said, sorry, something went wrong. It's not your fault. We are fixing it. <laughs> okay. That's nice. Uh, anyway. With all these people. It was scary. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Don. I'll never do that to you again. Uh, Simon is on his way. He did think it was tomorrow night. Um, but I quickly reminded him it is tonight. So he's busy uh, suiting up, as we can say, and he'll join us any second now. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Stephen Bain, Trisha Mulman, Gareth Hope Bailey, uh, Chris Shear, Chanel, Chazelle Glasgow, uh, Johnny Martin, Stephen Berry. Of course, we needed Stephen Berry to ask some educational questions. And, um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be another fanfare, basically. So please do ask away we are going to use as many of your questions as possible simon i think is don and i think you'll back me up i think when it comes to knowledge 
of MotoGP on track and off, probably one of the smartest guys on the planet. Yeah, I was just looking up before we um, before we came online. Yeah, I was just kind of reminding myself of his history. I remember in Motor Rider World, I did a story a while ago, all about you know who exactly is Simon Crafar. And for many people, he was he arrived in 2018 as this sort of slightly nervous uh, commentator. You know what I mean? He was yeah, and this was after we had Dylan Gray. You know, the smooth talking Dylan Gray. And that kind of put people off a little bit. But, I mean, I think now, especially as people are getting more used to Simon, they've stopped listening to the way he speaks and actually listen to what he has to say. Yeah, I mean, the dude yeah. rode 500 Grand Prix bikes. Uh, he raced World Superbikes. He raced, I mean, everywhere you can think of, he raced. He also then worked for Olin's. He worked for various teams. He did many things. So, yeah, and he also trains people how to ride. He's, he had a thing, mm -hmm. I think it was called Moto Voodoo. He has had hundreds of people come through where he's taught them how to ride. So he knows about, like, actual riding, like what's going yeah. on in a ride line. He knows what's going on with the motorcycles intimately. I mean, he knows about the suspension, mm -hmm. about what different things do. And he's also been a racer himself in that same. I mean, he is probably the most clued up guy in the entire paddock. So, yeah, it's very, we're very happy to have him. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very exciting. We do now have, and I'd like to introduce everybody to um, our guest for today, like Don and myself have touched upon, probably um, the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable man when it comes to, to motorcycles on and off the track. We're going to get some real inside information because he's the pit lane man in MotoGP at the moment. And I have to thank um, Mr. Brad Binder. For, for setting this up because after I checked the other night with Brad, I said, yes, I'd love to speak to Simon. Two days later, I got Simon's number and here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Simon Crayfar. Hey there. Here we go. <laughs> How are you going? Good on yourself, Simon. Yeah, good, good. Sorry to be late, guys. No. Oh, no. Uh, I think the mic has just gone off, Simon. Yeah, just check check your microphone. Yeah, he, he gets his wife to do everything for him. He knows motor. He knows. Mo there we go. I have no idea why I did that. I'm no <laughs> computer expert. <laughs> That's my wife's job. She's the tech <laughs> expert around here. You, you know everything. Well, yeah, you. you know everything. Riding. She lets her do the computers. Sounds sounds about right. Computer stuff. I'm I'm barbecue, <laughs> kitchen as well a bit, and. Uh, and uh, vehicles, yeah, vehicles is my kid. So that's what I've been doing, actually, so far in my summer holidays, is servicing the kids' cars, the kids' bikes, my bikes, my wife's car, my car. I was going to say, you're, you're in Andorra. I mean, you've been living there for quite a while. And, I mean, when we spoke to Brad and Darren, it sounds like it's just one giant MotoGP village, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you're right. There's a lot here now. When I first came here, um, talking end of 98, um, there was Norik Abe and Gary McCoy. That was it. Nobody else uh, from the from the paddock. One uh, manager was here, and that was it. So over the last, I would say, especially 10 years, it's gone whoosh, like a lot. Mm. And apparently it's in the cycle world as well. It's the most pro cyclists uh, there is in any country, I think, based here. So. Yeah, I mean, it's up north. It's right there in the mountains and all that. So I suppose it's like prime cycling territory. Yeah, I mean, my house is 1450 uh, meters above sea level. So uh, mm -hmm. then it goes up from there. So, yeah, I think good for the cyclists. So, Rob, what are we doing today? Rob's the boss and I just kind of follow him. Cool, yeah, cool. Don, so I've, I've got the access. Don's a little bit more intelligent than me. And then we've got our subscribers and our fans on the side that are more intelligent than us. Yeah, they're more intelligent than both of us put together. Yeah. So. <laughs> we're going to let them do a lot of the questions. Um, already everyone's um, tuning in saying, hello, Simon, mm -hmm. how are you doing? A lot of people are saying, how's it, Simon? How are you doing, But Now, have you heard Brad and Darren call you But yet? Do you know uh, what that means? I... You know what? I've heard it. I can't remember if they used it on me. I genuinely can't remember. Um, <laughs> no, so I can't. Rem I can't honestly answer that for sure. So sorry, I can't. I I, I, I do crack up. The last one I crack up. The South African, uh, you know, way of saying, "Is that right?" You know that uh, 
Um, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, that makes me. That makes, that makes me giggle. Hey, they're, they're good boys, aren't they? I, you must really enjoy chatting to them. They're they're great guys. I like talking to them in the paddock. I think all the journos do. Um, and they're, yeah, always polite. They're obviously. I haven't met mum and dad, but they're obviously well brought up. You know, mm. so polite and um, and they're hard bastards on the track, which I love. <laughs> yeah. I, I love how, how it's sort of strange. I know almost every single GP, you seem to get Darren on the other end of a microphone. And I, I love the way you watch him on track and how you expect him to be off track. It's completely different. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Um, I do that. Uh, I mean, there's part of it is I'm a supporter. You know, I think he'll, he's going to go all the way to the big class as well. Um, uh, but it's because he speaks well. And I know he doesn't want to talk on the grid. So the boys that speak well, that are going to give us something and don't want to speak on the grid. I want to support them. I try to get hold of them sometime in the weekend to tell us what's happening, you know, on track or about track conditions or something just to hear from them. So, yeah, that, that's the reason, really. We're both tough here in South Africa, Simon. We have to be because we we, we have to deal with a lot of stuff generally. Um before and you've we, got we, the All Blacks turning up there as well. <laughs> <regularly, so. laughs> no, that, that's one good. That's we've got the Binders and we've got a good rugby team. It's probably about it. <laughs> you know, I haven't watched rugby in like twenty years. Do we still have a good rugby team? I don't know. Yeah, we do. We yeah, do. We got some good boys. I, I no, went to I went to university. I was in res with Brian Habana, and I didn't even know it. Like I heard well. that there was a guy named Brian Habana. We we all called each other nicknames. So it was like five years into Banner's Springbok career before I figured out, hang on, I know that guy. He went to university with him. Shows no up back. <laughs> um, like, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking for people who – now a lot of people started watching MotoGP, got into, got into racing kind of in the last few years. They don't know much about you apart from, you know, when you suddenly arrived in front of the camera. I was thinking maybe like a little bit of a background for people, you know, quick sort of highlights of Simon Crayfar's life. Okay. Um, for, I got into bike racing, motocross first. Uh, my uncle was a motocrosser. Um, dad's a blacksmith, so it, I feel sorry for him. He, uh, We had free horses from day one, you know, good horses. But – it was transport for me, you know, horses. So I just yeah. went, I went like this, dad, 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 for about a year before he gave up and said, okay, I'll get you a bike, you know. And then it was motocross for a few years. He really supported me in that. Uh, then I got went to the road. I'll just skip through all this, went to road racing, then uh, managed to win at home, championship at home, and then uh, went to Japan for three months, then Malaysia for a year and a half basically trying to, you know, make mm. steps forward um, because New Zealand seems so small, you know, you've got to get out as soon as you do something. Then uh, from Malaysia, I went, Malaysia was fantastic. I learned lots there and they had really good machinery, cigarette money back then. So they had the latest stuff. It's where I kind of did my apprenticeship on a, on a super bike. Then I went to the UK, went one year in the UK British Championship and, um, I uh, got fourth in the championship there. Then um, it was on an RC30. Cal Fogarty rode it the year before. Um, yeah. Then I made probably the biggest uh, – well, the, the thing I'm most proud of, of my championship, uh, my whole career, I when they sat down at the end of the year and said, here's the deal again for the second year in the UK, I went – it was three times the money. I'd never been paid – properly before and company car and and i know i'm going world championship because i did three world two bikes that yeah. year three rounds I said i've got to go world championship they said oh you've got a job and i went no and i went home sat in new zealand till march and then the phone rang and it was a private 500 team uh that their rider got refused entry because of his results the year before and um, they said you want to ride it for nothing you know and I went, that's what it, World Championship, you know. So started from the bottom in uh, World Championship. And, uh, yeah, went, then yeah, then I went back to World Superbikes for four years. Uh, managed to get 
fifth and sixth in the World Superbike Championship. Um, and uh, then got re- 97 was my best year in World Superbikes, fighting for the podium every year, every uh, weekend, you know, every it was going good. Uh, lots of stupid luck, like tires delaminating while leading, uh, engines going while in second, uh, taken out. <laughs> but it was a great year performance wise, and it got me an offer in uh, 500. Um, 500 Grand Prix, so MotoGP back then. And I managed to get a win and two podiums, two a second and a third in my first year there, which was... That was with the Red Bull Yamaha, Peter Clifford's gang. Yeah, 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 which was, uh, yeah, yeah, a dream come true. Because my, uh, and then it went, like, make the uh, Pink Floyd, you know, the the, the plane diving. (laughs) I I changed, we changed tire brand. And I couldn't ride the other brand, you know. I was a second slower as I was on the other one. And um, then after a few tests and some races that I wasn't doing any good in, uh, the team said, you know, uh, do you want to go? And I said, well, can't we change tyres? And they went, Simon, it's easier to change the rider than it is the tyres, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that's it, it came to an abrupt halt. But... Yeah. My dream was always to ride that beautiful machinery, you know, that I had in the magazines back then because it wasn't internet, uh, the factory bikes, you know. My dream was to ride them against the best guys in the world and dad doesn't have to pay. I didn't yeah. realise you got paid when you got there. It bought my house. <laughs> so yeah. I'm so lucky, you know, not many people get to do it. So I'm super yeah. happy. Isn't it true? Is this, uh, isn't it true that you were the last Dunlop rider to win the Premier Grand Prix class? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was yeah. Yeah. Shame. Shame. It's. Not, I mean, there's good and bad that there's not. Um, you know that it's a one make. You know series mm. and you know tire wise. Um, I think there's pros and cons. I mean, it's better for the planet. That's for sure. Because when it was two or three brands. Um, I would go through, no kidding, or we would go through, I, because I was kind of leading the Dunlop charge that year, I would use eight tyres in a one-hour session. No kidding. Three yeah. fronts, three fronts, five rears, and you had to go through what was the best and then then back-to-back them the next session against another, uh, the best ones against others, you know. And when it's a tyre battle as well, that's – the sort of, uh, you know, sort of hardware that gets thrown at it. So it's better now that it's much more limited. Everyone's got the same. Yeah. Better for the planet, put it that way. I don't know for the sport. Uh, can I share a quick anecdote with you? Sorry, it just pops in my head now. You took that – it was a win at Donington on the mm-hmm. 500 Grand Prix. I think it was in your first year back on a 500 Grand Prix bike after four or five years in World Superbikes. And yeah. when you took that win, we actually had the South African round of the World Superbikes – uh, the races won at exactly the same time. And afterwards, we were sitting in the press conference, and I think there was Cole Fogarty, Brett Francesco Keeley, and someone else. I don't know. Yeah. And somebody mentioned the, the you know, during one of the questions, somebody mentioned the the Donington Grand Prix. And I think it was Cole Fogarty. I think it won the race. Went, oh, uh, who won that? And they went, uh, it was Simon Crafer. And they went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Fog- Foggy told me once that, um, I think his words were along the line of, that's one that I always wanted to win. You know, the British Grand Prix, uh, yeah. you know, so which you could understand. I, I think he, he almost got third, didn't he? Yeah, on, he got on a third. He ran yeah. out of petrol on it. It just yeah. missed out. He ended up fourth or something. Oh, that, that wasn't fair. But, yeah, that's a rider and a half, Foggy. He was, a, he was a, another hard man. <laughs> And he was one of these sort of guys that's like, no matter what was happening with the bike, with the tires, whatever, he was going to go out on Sunday. He was going to show everyone, you know. Uh, it, must right. be, it must have been quite someone to race against. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, really. Um, the way I would describe him is, it, like you just said, it didn't matter where, like on Saturday night, riders, teams all sit down and go through the grid, you know, and you know the guys that have done a one off lap. And they're ahead of you, but they're not going to be ahead of you in the race, you know. Especially mm. second half, they'll go, they'll fade. Because uh, just for the listeners, it takes experience and 
some people figure it out and some don't, how to keep the lap times going as the tyres drop off. Mm. And um, there's especially younger, less experienced riders or riders that just never figured it out. They can do the lap on the new tyres when you've got the edge grip. But when the edge grip goes, you have to ride the bike differently and not everyone figures it out. So you're going through the list and you go, right, I might be sixth on the grid, but there is three of those guys I was telling you about that are going to drop off, you know. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter where the foggy was two rows behind you on the grid, you knew he'd be there tomorrow, you know. He's one of those guys that always he just uh, found something more on Sunday, you know, to make it work. Yeah. Um, Simon, just quickly, we, we, we've we talked about your, your World Superbike and, and your 500 Grand Prix days racing. How different is the paddock now compared to then? I mean, we look at, at riders these days being these finely tuned athletes. I mean, they're like triathletes. They can do anything, probably the fittest athletes in the world. How was it? I mean, were you guys, you know, we didn't really look at that back when you guys were racing. We just saw you guys go race. We remember the Barry Sheen smoking, drinking. How has racing changed, especially you being in the paddock now as it is now and back then? I mean, how, how much has the paddock evolved? Um, I would say that that the thing that there's two big changes that I can see um, is the demands on the rider. Um, you're just saying to me how much more you see of the rider now, and that's what's changed. Their demands mm -hmm. for interviews and, um, you know, press conferences and it has much more, you know. So they're, they're working more hours. Like they've got less free time. We had uh, one press conference or something. There, there was no social media, no, no one want, wanted to do videos for different things or different countries tv channels these guys have got all that their own countries channels then the um you know dawner's feed they've got so many demands on them that they've got to have press officers that make all the meeting times and run them around and i still see them in leather suit sometimes at seven o'clock at night they mm. still got out of their leathers you know which is that, that's pretty demanding that side's changed and um, uh, the the other big one for me is um, how much pressure is on them on the bike because the whole field, like we're on, they're all on the same tyres now. They're they're all good machines now. You know, when I rode, the the guys at the very back had rubbish compared to the guys at the very front, and now the guys at the very back have last year's factory bike you know, is like serious competitive so you can't get out of bed anymore and have a little bit of an off day and only lose a position or two you lose 10 positions you know so massive pressure on them i would say that's the two biggest things because you can say the machinery's changed yeah but we all know that it's come on you know and it's faster and it's better and the tires are better and brake everything's better but the the safety's got better, the equipment's got better. But the big changes for me are those two things. The de and it's both really demands on the rider, huge. Um, I want to know, okay, so I remember I chatted to Troy Corsa about this once. The Okay, we idolized the 500 Grand Prix bikes, especially late 90s from then on. And we're like, wow, those things were completely unrideable. And, you know, you, you've got to be on, you have your wits about you and all of that. Now I want to know you. You rode the 500s in the late 90s, and nowadays you be you do like you do the onboard lap on the BMW. Uh, it's, it's an M or an S thousand double R. I what, did. I did. Sadly, that stopped the last year and a half. Midway, uh, yeah, midway through one year, uh, I didn't get told the full story. But I think the budget stopped coming from GoPro for whatever reason. Uh, just looking around in the shops, I think there's a lot of other cameras to buy and maybe their mm. sales went down or something. Something like that's going on. So I don't get to do that anymore. But I do uh, have yeah, a special well, one of those coming up soon. Oh, nice. But um, I want to know, so, I mean, those 500 Grand Prix bikes, I, 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 this was a few years ago. I was Troy Corsa. He was at a launch. I said, well, uh, how did these modern S1000 RRs compare to the 500s and that that you used to race? And he went, oh, mate, they're way better. These new bikes are way better. 
Uh, mm. Is it a case of what we're writing now is just has it surpassed what we had then, what we used to idolize? Oof, that's a good question. Um, I, I mean, I back to bat for a press thing, my own bike. I was doing a test at Le Castellet, uh, Paul Ricard, um, mm -hmm. beautiful track, the big one there. Um, yeah. And the uh, the very first R1 came out at the same year as 98. And um, mm. they brought it, Yamaha brought the latest R1 there and said, go for a ride on it, you know. And I wasn't allowed to say it at the time, but it was an absolute dog compared to what I was riding. I, my mechanic said, what was it really like, Zion? I said, it was like someone had pulled a spark plug off my bike. It was just going, uh, like, so, and, and I know that the bikes have come a long way, but I just think, um, the thing is, those bikes, yeah, the, the new bikes are awesome, the new street bikes, they really, really are, um, but they're still street bikes in that they're relatively soft, relatively heavy, because they've got too much junk on, compared to if you rode a superbike version of it, you know. Um, so, yeah, the, the modern bikes are much better. Everything's come on, but they're still street bikes if you're riding a street bike, you know. And, yeah. and that's how I feel when I ride the GoPro bike or the – they're beautiful, but they're spongy, soft. You can't really feel what's going on because it's not – you don't get that feedback through everything. And like I said, with all the junk on them to make them heavy – and the soft suspension especially and probably mapping to make it nice and smooth and but when when you ride a real built one of those it's, it'll be totally different uh, you, that's my hey one other thing to say is the light bikes when you ride them you know with all that stuff on there they're really lightened up and firm suspension it gets harder and harder to feel the limit you know yeah. and also it's a lot more work because they've got gearboxes that are everything's a lot closer so you're doing double the amount of changes as you would on the stock bike and i've seen it before where a young guy that i've been teaching over the last sort of 13 years i've been teaching on track I, I saw it that a young guy who was talented he was going really fast on a stock thousand that dad was so excited he went and bought him a an h implant honda from honda last year's bike put him on it and he went a second slower mm, mm. because they're yeah. a the easiest way to describe it as a professional tool, you know, mm. and the, the street bikes are damn good and they're easier to work, easy to use. So when you get on the professional tool, you go, Oh, this is hard. So yeah. you need a professional to get the extra out of them. You know, that's there, but it's not easy. You know, I hope that makes sense. But, yeah, it does. Yeah, uh, Colin Edwards. Once we asked him, well, what, what, we go also. He got off World Superbikes and he got onto MotoGP. And we said, like, well, what was the difference? He said, man, World Superbikes is like sitting on a big comfy couch. MotoGP is like sitting on a bar stool. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's he's bang on. That's what I felt as well. I, I described it. As I remember when I first got on there, someone was asking me, uh, and I, I said, the difference is like you know. Uh, when you're, you know, a teen and you're driving dads, did you have you guys grow up with Holdens? You know, the Australian car Holdens. Uh, or, no, yeah. well, it's, uh, it's called a Chevrolet. I've actually got one, yeah. Lumina. Okay, so yeah. okay, a Chev, like it's six cylinder from the seventies or sixties and seventies, yeah. and they ran out at the age. A big old family car, your dads, and you, and you give it a thrash, and you're like, <laughs> lots of warning, and you know that yeah. extra weight. And then you get in mum's little hatchback and you go, and you grip, 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 wham, it goes. So that edge is so much harder to feel, you know. And again, because it's the less weight and harder suspension, you know, that allows you to to do something extra, but it's harder and harder to feel the limit, you know. And the, the one that I, I 500 was really like that because the weight, 250 GP bike, even more. 
you know, mm. because they're so like they were incredibly ha incredible handling things. Probably just to throw in there, probably the most beautiful handling bike I've ever ridden is a two fifty Grand Prix bike. Uh, truly amazing. Um, but I, I'm six foot and too heavy, so yeah, you need a little guy in those. Okay, we're going to get to a, a fan question here, and this is a real big fan, Stephen uh, Kalgoxi. I never know how to say his surname, so I hope I said that right. Simon, I've been a massive fan going back to when you rode for Kawasaki on the ZX7RR in World Supers. What is your take on the ZX7RR back in those days? Oh, beautiful. I rode it, um, it was my first full factory like contract to ride for them in 96 alongside Gobit, uh, Go and I, and the, it was a brand new bike then, and like always happens or usually happens, is the the manufacturer hasn't had, had enough time, or the guys on the bench haven't had enough time to develop the engine, and the bike handled beautiful, like they've done a really good job, and uh, but it was dog slow, and mm -hmm. Goey and I basically trying to make it do something crashed our brains out all year. And then we turned up in 97. Well, Goey didn't. He'd, uh, he went ride, I think he got 500 Lucky Strike. So he, yeah, Lucky Strike, yeah. yeah. And so Yanagawa came along, and it was bang on because they'd had the winter on the bench. They call it the dyno, trying things and exhaust and whatever, camshafts. And, and the thing had power as well as the good handling, you know. It was magic. And that's why I had that good year, you know. Uh, obviously, me learning, but. The bike was there as well uh, because before we couldn't even stay in the slipstream of the Dukes and Hondas and now we could, you know. So, yeah, it was, and it, I think it was better handling than what we were racing against. It was a beautiful bike. Uh, sorry, Don, quickly, Simon, you, you, you spoke about Anthony Gobert there quick. Yep. Do you think probably one of the most naturally talented riders you've ever seen that unfortunately just didn't get it right? Um, I... Have no problem saying he's yeah he's the I think the most talent raw natural ability I've ever seen yeah mm -hmm. and um yeah it just a waste because um uh it just shows that you need the whole package you know mm -hmm. to be a professional yeah. sports person which I think is good because it means uh. Guys like me can fight against guys yeah. like Gary by, you know, work ethic, uh, learning, just bat banging your head against the wall, trying to get that, you know what I mean? Because there is guys like, oh, I mean, Mick Doohan was, in my era, was the guy with the highest level of both, mm. and, meaning work ethic and natural ability. Mm. And the guys like um, uh, Kaczynski, Biagi, I'd say maybe even Rossi have, um, I would say, more natural ability than Mick. Um, but Mick was just so stubborn, you know, uh, which is it's, – so it's always a balance, you know, yeah. of those two things, I think, you know. Being clever, learning, but work ethic and natural ability. It's I think – I bet it's the same if you spoke to a rugby guy or a tennis person or – I'm sure it's the same thing. Yeah, amazing rider. Incredible what he could uh, do, but <laughs> he was a worry as well. <laughs> I've, I've got a friend who uh, he's a journalist in Australia, and he told me a whole lot of stories about uh, – I, I won't repeat them here, but he told me a lot of stories about after the races with, with Gobert and uh, let's just say certain substances and certain <laughs> feminine persuasion people. And, yeah, anyway, you get – as I said, not yeah, really much of an ethic there. Yeah, I think the the sad thing is uh, Goey didn't have. I think respect would be the a fair mm -hmm. summary. You know, he didn't have respect enough respect for the people around the people he's writing for the other writers, and um, yeah, that for whatever reason, you know that. But that I think that was a bit their big problem. Uh, you know, yeah. Simon, yeah. I wanted to ask you. Um, you, you touched upon the work ethic and, and the natural talent. Do you think – I've seen it with, with a couple of guys, and I, and I think in a way it splits Brad and Darren Binder. I think 
I've always seen it. I've, I've known Brad and Darren. Darren was seven. Brad was nine when I first met them. I've done a bit of training with them and stuff. And I always saw Darren as the more natural talent and Brad the work harder. And if I look at you, you've gone into this role of wanting to know how suspension works, wanting to, you talked about feeling of a motorbike and you would feel a bike. Do you think that, you know, you had to work harder on getting that feeling, understanding how a bike works to compensate maybe for not having the natural talent? Um, the thing is, uh, I mean, the guys I grew up with, with uh, racing would say natural talent. Of course you had it. I think you have to have a certain amount even to get yeah. there. Yeah, you've got yeah. to be good. But the very special guys, there's always a few of those, you know. There, there's only there's only ever a couple of them around at a time. You know what I mean? That are crazy natural ability that leave all the guys who are have good amount of natural ability, but they're not the freaks like that. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. So the thing is, what I've, I can tell, yeah, um, Brad is a as a worker, you know, he's, he thinks he works, he's sort of professional, you know, and I really admire him for that. Mm. And he, he, yeah, he's professional on every level, you know, like mm. that I've watched. Uh, um, and the good thing is about Darren is um, this last year or so, year or two, it was the last year I think I saw him really looking like he was treating it like it was the most important thing. You know what I mean? Putting it first. And I think that's what a sports person, like I don't know them well enough to know this. I'm only saying from what I'm seeing at work. Yeah. And it looks like he's, for the first time, put it first racing, you know. And I think a sports person has to do that, you know, if they're going to beat. Because you're up against guys who are prepared to do that. And so you can't beat them unless you do too, you know. Or you can't beat them in the end anyway. You know, you might beat him a few races, but not over the whole year. So, yeah, it looks like Darren's. And I think, like it sounds like you do, that uh, if Darren keeps on like that, he can make it all the way to the big class, which will be great to see. I'd love to see him on even next year Moto2. I mean, he's one of the heaviest riders of Moto3, and he says he does suffer, especially under acceleration. Uh, yeah. What do you think, Darren on a Moto2? Oh, I can't wait to see it. It, it sounds like it's going to happen listening to Goss, you know. Mm. You know, you kind of get a feel of who's talking to who and it sounds like it's going to happen next year, like Darren on a Moto2 bike. And uh, oh, it, it's always hard to change class, so don't expect him to set the world on fire, especially the first half of the year. It's not usual, um, but he will. I reckon he'll figure it out and he's – Got to be one of the hopes, you know, like I said, to get all the way through Moto 2 and in, into the big class. Um, I wanted to ask something quickly about, you said, you know, uh, work ethic and all of that. Uh, do you think that sort of times have changed? I mean, uh, I know when I sort of started, or well, Rob and I sort of started racing similar sort of time, and I think it was sort of similar with you. I mean, the way you started racing until you were pretty much in your 20s or something like that is you and dad go down to the track and basically, you're just figuring it out. I mean, you don't yeah. quite know. I mean, I was kind of lucky because my dad raced already. But, I mean, he was sort of a bit old school. Uh, Rob in a similar position. But you sort of go to the track and you just kind of figure it out. And you keep figuring it out until you end up in a, you know, into one of the professional teams. And only then do you start getting people telling you, okay, try this, try that. Whereas <laughs> I get the feeling, especially in Europe now, I mean, you've got young kids getting spotted and kind of mentored very early. Yeah. And, I mean, that uh, – I. I Dare I say, I mean, you've got guys like Acosta and them are all very, very talented. But I suspect there is a lot going on sort of behind the scenes even before they made it into Grand Prix. Oh, I mean, the way I grew up, it sounds like yours, that the guys you're racing against, most of them don't even want to tell you what you should do with your bike. And I, I was working on my own bike, scratching my head going, in the beginning it was even tire pressures. I didn't know what, you know. And then you slowly figure out, like you said, by making mistakes. And um, but, but I should throw in there, uh, you might have heard of Mike Webb, uh, race control, like his race director. Yeah. He was the guy, the only guy who would tell me, you know, honestly. The other yeah. guys either would tell you wrong or... 
<laughs> on purpose or um, not tell you. And Mike, because he's such a gentleman, I could just go up to him. He's 10 years older than me, so I was 15, he was 25. And I could go up and go, Mike, what should I – tire pressure or what should I do because my bike's doing this? And uh, so that's why I love Mike. He's been like that uh, the whole way through. Um, and anyway, uh, yeah, it's so you don't really get, like you said, until I got to – really it was to Europe – into world championship teams where you have people that really know, you know? Um, okay, national championship, I learned a lot, uh, and I learned what adjustments do what, you know, like changing the triple clamps on there for the offset, uh, right height position springs, preload. I, I started to understand all, all that, but I think we were going in and out of the ballpark, you know, where the guys at world championship level, when they get hold of these young guys, they know where the bike works, you know, mm. <laughs> because they've worked with other guys who've won races at World Championship on that bike, so really mm. high level. So they know all of the windows you can't really go out of. And when a rider turns up to a team like that, it's just magic, you know, because you'll complain about something and they'll know where to, what to do, you know. Mm. And so, yeah, and then there's – um Obviously, there's different teams that specialize on, you know, even now, what I'm trying to say is there's even uh, more head doctor people around, you know, riders. Yeah, because, course. like I was telling you before, there's so much more pressure on riders. I think they need that, you know. It's like uh, I don't envy them now because the pressure is on those boys huge, you know. Uh, the, the The class is so... The depth of field is so amazing. Like I was saying, you know, get out of bed, not feeling 100%, and you're going to drop 10 positions, you know, and it happens. You see it. And, um, yeah, so I think they need some support as well because they're young with massive pressure on. So, uh, yeah, they'll be beat. And I think all good sports people beat themselves up. You don't need to tell them they're doing shit or they need to hurry up. <laughs> they're they're yeah. their own hardest critics. That's how they get there, you know. And um, and so it probably, if they're not going well, they're really going to beat themselves up, which can help a downward spiral. So I think it's good to have p solid people around to help them, you know. I've got a question here. Um, I'm not going to even try and say the surname, but it's Michael. And I remember this. We had a great New Zealand rider in the 80s in South Africa, Dave Hiscock. Took over Ooh, from yeah. his brother Neville, rode yeah. for Suzuki. And I remember my dad used to ra race against Dave. Dave used to come over to our house often uh, with, with mm. all the guys. Dave was like another uncle to me. And I was just as lighty. And he was this real superstar because I always thought he was South African that just spoke a little bit differently until I got <laughs> older. And my dad said, no, he's actually from New Zealand. And you know much about Neville and Dave? Oh, the thing is, I don't. I was the young motocrosser like 14 sitting in the crowd watching yeah. these guys at cemetery circuit and manfield and um they were like heroes you know and so um yeah they rode that plastic fantastic that got made and ended um the the, the monocoque things you know the beautiful bikes um with like g611 you know or katana type yeah. uh, engine yeah. Um, and the other guy, other guy of the same era were, would have been Robert Holden, um, Bob yep. Toomey. Those guys were what I went – they were the guys I went to watch, you know. But I didn't know them because I was a kid, you know. I, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I was yeah. uh, not even road racing at the time. I did get to know Robert Holden, who was probably a few years younger than them, but battled with them and beat them. He was damn good. Um, I got to meet him in, in uh, more in Europe when I – got to Europe, but uh, sadly he got killed at the Isle of Man, so mm. didn't get to know him more. <clears throat> I'm just thinking about New Zealand. Is he, uh, the cemetery, that's in New Zealand, isn't it? The cemetery, cemetery yeah. Oh, it's, got a, it's got a railway crossing or something, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, you're kind of breaking and turning across it, which is... <laughs> <laughs> that's why not, not great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was one of the – well, it's probably the one that got the most publicity, you know, the most television coverage, etc. So we all did it, 
but uh, I wasn't really a fan. Early on, I just didn't know any better, and I'd come from motocross. I thought, this is fine. But as you got to a bit older and figure it out, I started going, oh, I don't want to go there, especially when you see a few crashes, you know, and there's no runoff. So I wasn't really that fired up at later on. And I was probably going faster, so, you know, yeah. you, you know, or getting wiser. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, we, I was lucky enough to have – there were seven circuits in NZ when I grew up. We've lost a few to housing developments and that, but um, even though they weren't beautiful circuits, it's good to have seven places to go to ride your bike. So you know, I was lucky. Okay, I'm just looking at some very important <clears throat> questions that people are asking. We've got a lot of – technical questions and i'm just trying to hone in on them here because you are probably the perfect guy to to answer those questions um wade wilson simon why is it so difficult to manage the tires on modern day era bikes as we can see motor gps run into trouble mid-race um oh, i think it's always been a, a problem it's not just i mean the thing is it's getting harder and harder to make the the bikes do the distance because they're going faster and faster we've got more and more power you know over the decades but um it's always been a problem you know to try and get because these bikes had a lot of power for a long time um it's probably talked about more you know uh, but it's always been a problem um but nowadays these new hassles which are um because the the tires are getting worked so damn hard mm. now, uh, both by brakes, by these awesome riders. Uh, so you're talking front and rear getting such a hard time that the new development is, um, you know, things like there's a tire temperature window, and if they go too slow, you know, <laughs> the, yeah. the guys crash. Because yep. the tires start turning back into plastic, almost. You know, yep. that's what it what it feels like when you cold, crash on a cold tire. Um, and then there's tires, uh, the tire front tire getting too much temperature because they're slipstreaming other bikes. Mm -hmm. So the front tire, we've heard that, seen that over the last two years quite a bit. Aragon was a bad one for the Yamahas, where they're, they're getting the slipstream, which they need for fuel consumption you know, to help fuel consumption, and they need four top speed, you know, to stay in there to make the lap time easier. But then the front tire gets no air, temperature goes up, and with temperature comes pressure because they're, they're not allowed to run, um, was it helium? Uh, is it, I want to say helium. What was it? Nitrogen. Uh, we used to run. Uh, nitrogen. Sorry? Yeah. Nitrogen. Yeah. Nitrogen, sorry, that's what I want to say. Helium's a laughing gas. In hospital, I'm getting the hospital days looked up. Um, <laughs> oh, motocross crashes and helium <laughs> while they're scrubbing your arm. Oh, my God, it's not fun. Um, so, yeah, nitrogen neutralizes that, you know, but not allowed to run it. For, I haven't actually okay. asked why. But so they'd make a dry air. They've got compressors that take the moisture out of the air. And when they take the moisture out of the air, um, they get less, uh, you know, rise under pressure or drop under cooling. But the problem is slipstreaming, and like I was saying, the tire pressure goes uh, up because of the temperature, and you once you get up too high, you get a smaller contact patch, too small, and they lose grip, you know. And uh, so, it's yes, the question's good. It is getting harder to manage. Hey, can I throw in there? I spoke to a rider on Sunday night of the first Qatar race, and I went, uh, I said to him, man, it looked hard, you know, fuel, um, you know, tyre pressure manager, the, you guys have got so much to do now, you know. And he's saying, he's this rider said to me, Simon, you should have been at the meeting on Saturday night before the race. One engineer is saying, we're going to need you to get some slipstream for the fuel economy, you know, because we're touch and go. Qatar is quite a hard one. You know, if we want to run the faster map, you know, to keep the power, to be competitive here, we need you to get some slipstream for a fair bit of the race. And then the other guy is going, yeah, but not too much because the tyre pressure is going to go through the roof. And 
I mean, and these guys have got buttons and messages to drop the power, you know, to keep the fuel economy going. They use the power quite high to settle into the race, you know, the right position. And as soon as they're settled in, they turn it back down to look after the tyre and the fuel. And then at the end, so they've got some more to fight if it's the last lap. I mean, we used to just ride it. <laughs> you know, yeah. just ride it and worry about what grip you had at the end, you know. And, <laughs> and so hopefully, yeah, yeah, you had to manage the rear tire a bit. But yeah. this is crazy what they have to go through now. Like, yeah, I remember we asked uh, Brad actually when you first joined MotoGP last year. Uh, it was actually at a res. Uh, two things about it. I said to him, "Well, considering there's no qualifying tires, why? What exactly is the reason qualifying is so much faster than?" Uh, the race pace and the other thing is the whole sort of following riders you know the front tire and yeah well first of all following riders he said it, you you don't understand how much heat comes off those motorcycles he was saying that his fingers actually started burning you know the brake lever was almost too hot to pull because you when, when he followed other riders it actually heated his brake lever up that it was nearly burning him and he also said one of the reasons why you can pull such a fast lap time in qualifying is because you only have to do one lap he says yeah. you cannot ride like that for a whole MotoGP race. You just you won't yeah. be able to hold the handlebars. Your tires will melt. Uh, he was saying a lot of it is just you know it's just effort. It's just the amount yeah. of effort you have With to exert. Three hundred horsepower. I suppose the closest thing the listeners will be able to relate it to is the the ones that ride dirt bikes. If you ride a dirt bike on a motocross track as fast as you can, flat out, you don't last very long. And that's mm. what Brad's talking about. You know, physically. It is like, yeah, it's serious. Um, yeah, the heat, uh, it's a big thing the engineers talk about when I do these tech talks and that I, is the heat from that engine goes through everything, you know, and so everything's connected and normally in aluminium, you know, most commonly, and aluminium conducts heat pretty well. And I remember, I remember doing Suzuka 8 hour and I have like blisters on the soles of my feet, uh, on the balls of my feet, where they touch the foot pegs because of the heat going through everything and it basically starting to cook the bottom of your feet, you know. So about the size of a golf ball, blister, you know, like round, obviously flatter. Yeah. Um, and everything else that touches the bike, the skin's worn off, you know, because you're sweating, your skin softens, you know, from all the sweat. And then you've got – so I'm talking inside of your knees, uh, mm. your hands – your feet, your butt, has your skin's gone off it, you know. It's what happens in those hot races. So partly through the temperature, and the other part is the sweat makes your skin soft. So. Jeez, uh, um, we've got to, yeah, okay, carry on. <laughs> oh, sorry, Don, I just want to ask this, and this is going to be a, a question that you can delve into uh, for us, Simon. Hey, Simon, from Mark Vokes. Hey, Simon, does a team like Honda handle and diagnose electronic uh Anomalies. Anomalies, like the one that high-sided Mark is so bad. And just <clears throat> add on to that question, what do you think has gone wrong at Honda since the Mark? Because I don't think it just happened when Mark is crashed and hasn't been here. It kind of was already happening when Mark was doing that Sepang test a few years ago. I totally agree. Uh, I, I remember the crash that Mark had this spectacular one that I really admire him for getting straight back on the bike for at Thailand, that big mm -hmm. high side. Mm -hmm. And um, and then he went fastest in the next session, like, or part of the way through, he was fastest. And I was just going like, yeah, he's, he's stunning. Um, it was already happening then because no one else could ride the bike. You know, if Mark was, yeah, Mark was fastest, but no one, everyone else on the Honda was going like, you know, and Carl is good, you know. Uh, the yeah. who else was riding? Tucker was riding at the time. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Um, Lorenzo. Yeah, Lorenzo. I was thinking Lorenzo was it before that? Anyway, um, it was at Thailand, and it was really clear that they had a problem. I even mentioned it to some Honda staff that I know, uh, that I know, you know, and saying like, "It doesn't look good, man. Well, you haven't got Mark. You haven't got anything. You know, there's nobody there." And the, the, this guy was saying, yeah, we know. So it's a good few years of the – and Mark just rode around it, didn't he? Mm. And, um, yeah, it looks like now uh, with his arm slowly coming back, you know, um, and he's had a long time with the bike, that it is not as easy to do, you know. He was 
an absolute freak, wasn't he? I, and I mean that positively. It's, it's amazing what he was doing on the bike, um, but it's not normal. And I think Honda will be worried. They need to sort it out so they can have um, more riders. Or And, I mean, yeah, to get some results again, you know, because it's, it's not good. Um, about the little technical glitch at... A little it ended in a big high side for Mark. Um, you can imagine what's going on behind. There'd be people yelling about that, you know, riders yelling at engineers and team manager going, Yeah, you, he's trying to kill me. <laughs> That's what it'd feel like if you're right trying to ride the bike and you need to trust it and it does that, you know, meaning no traction for a moment and no traction control. Um, you there's going to be yelling matches going on in there so uh yeah and that's a big company they'll be more than analyzing it they will not want it to happen again because imagine if it ended mark's career or one of their other riders so it's yeah serious but what do you think uh, the problem is there simon with honda now do you think it's electronics do you think it's engine do you think you know they're one of the only guys i think the only team that uses shower suspension what do you think on they're going they're playing with wings and going up and down what do you think um, they've lost their way a bit yeah, or they're on Olin's. So they used to be uh i should say erlins it's pronounced it sounds like er you know is the correct way the o with the two dots is er uh, so erlins okay. um they are on um erlins and Sure, they used to be on Showa. That's what you would have got there. I think Honda yeah, owns Showa. Showa's good stuff. It's just, I think, easier in the paddock when there's a big pool of information like Olin's. It's, early. Yes. it's hard to fight against, you know? So Honda ended up going that way. But uh, I think Honda have lost their way. That's the obvious thing to me, um, is they've lost their way uh, for whatever reason. It's been over a few years. Uh, and I think I'm guessing some of the problems coming from engine. Mm. Uh, when you, my job is to listen to everybody, interview everybody. And if you put everything together from different people, it makes a bit of a picture. None of them yeah. want to tell you the whole story because they're not yeah. allowed or, or don't want to. But if you take all of them and put them together, it, it's like pretty obvious that they've been struggling big style for more than a year with grit on entry uh, and exit from the rear tire, you know, mm -hmm. and they, because of that lack of grip on entry, they push the front more, you know, because mm -hmm. the rear is not helping them slow it down. Um, and rear grip, a lack of rear grip on exit is a nightmare for a rider like acceleration wise, isn't it? Um, I think I, my opinion is at least part of it's coming from engine because uh, I think, as I've heard, Honda didn't want to, you know, like have the, uh, you know, when they had that, um, where they've had a freeze on engines and stuff. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm not at the meetings. I don't talk to someone who is there. But I, my understanding is Honda weren't that keen on that engine freeze. Um, and I know how much if you get something internally wrong, how much it affects the handling as well, you know, mm -hmm. because if you get a crankshaft weight wrong or a camshaft or some delivery problem wrong mm -hmm. in the engine, it can affect hugely the, the grip and handling, you know, of the bike. Yeah. Because that crank spinning around yeah. in there, the wrong yeah. weight, it affects negatively the bike. So, mm -hmm. hey, sorry to throw it out, but my genuine feeling is they've lost their way a bit and big style and uh they will find it back they mm. they'll find it because they're really recognizing now they have a problem they haven't just got a rider that's going to win anyway and they don't need to fix anything they need to fix it and mm. honda honda with their budget their experience their manpower hrc they will come back i wouldn't be surprised if if uh early to mid next year when because the freeze comes off you know Next year, mm -hmm. early to mid next year, they've got a good bike again. You know, if KTM can do it, Honda can. Mm. Uh, I want to quickly. I'm going to go back in time a little bit. Sorry, I, I used to watch you in the '90s and all of that. So forgive me. Um, I don't care what's going on these days. But anyway, um, Alan John Fenter, he used to race. Uh, uh, he's 
he's our local Isle of Man racer and all kinds of things. He, he shared a memory, and I, and I remember watching this thinking, and I'll tell you what I kind of thought. It was uh, Assen when you were racing 500s. The, 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 you, were, you had set a blistering lap, and you were, on, you were sort of set for pole. Yeah, the joint qualifying. And then there was a red flag came out with like three minutes to go. Yeah. And uh, you decided not to go out, but Mick Doohan and a few others went out. And it was just sort of like, it was pretty much a Super Bowl session. I, I timed it right. And it yeah. wasn't that I was decided not to go out. I had no more tyres left. Okay. You know, I'd used my qualified tyres. And um, I think I have two of them on the, on the second session. And I know I'll be a second slower on a worn one. Then I would be on a brand new one. So there's no, there's yeah. impossible for me to go faster. So there's nothing I can do. You know, if I go, uh, I to, to me, I'd timed it perfectly. Two minutes to go, yeah. uh, bang, got the lap in, and there's a red flag. I'm like, oh sweet. Then they ran it again. You know, yeah. Mick goes there. Was it two and a half minutes or three or something? It was not many minutes left. I thought yeah. I'd timed it perfect. And then Mick, uh, everyone tried. Lots of people attempted because they had tires left. They were using yeah. them a couple of minutes later, you know. Um, everyone that had a tyre left went back out there. And Mick was the only one that really managed to do something. And it was damn impressive. Like, really yeah. was. Uh, I In that video, you can't hear what I'm saying, but I, I said to my crew chief, um, well, there's nothing we can do. You know, he knew that. You know, so let's just watch. And I didn't think they could do it in one lap. And yeah. after the first split or so, I said, wow, that's impressive. And I said to my crew chief, if he does this, I've got to shake his hand because it's a big risk, you know, a big risk to – it wasn't real warm temperatures. It was so easy to get a tire to catch you, you know, um, and he just put it all on the line and did it. And I was like – so my crew chief said, well, you better go shake his hand. And I went, you know, <laughs> well, uh, I think I even said – <laughs> you know, halfway around. Yeah, anyway, because it was. It was I went down there. Mick is um was my training partner at that time. You know, we spent off season cycling and going to the gym together. Uh I was staying in Aussie at the time for the off season, training with him and a couple of others. And so I knew him really well, you know. And mm. so I walked down there to shake his hand and he shook my hand, but he looked at me with hate. Like, he hated me, I, and he'd never looked at me like that before. I went, mean, whoa. And later on, I asked him, uh, when I say later on, after we'd finished racing, you know, both of us, I said, remember that day you you, uh, you looked at me with hate, you know? I just wanted to understand that, what well, was the story, you know? Um, and he said, you made me risk my body. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, it was like, Mick, thought this is my fucking pole position <laughs> and he is making me, you know, it, it yeah. Was, yeah. and he's my friend. Don't, I'm not talking, <laughs> about, talking about it. I'm just giving you an insight to yeah. his thinking. Yeah. Like, like uh, yeah. yeah, he was, he's so determined, a huge respect to the guy. Uh, okay. More so what I want to ask is what, what impressed me when I watched that. Okay. I, th I saw a mixed lap and I thought, geez, okay. You know, you remind you, 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 you. It reminds you of who McDuard was. I mean, he was yeah. a special guy. But yeah. something else is, I mean, they they kept putting the camera across to you, standing in the pits watching this. And as Mick was setting this blistery lap, you were smiling the whole time. You know, you were like, "Wow, wow!" Yeah, and then it, well, was, it was so impressive, really. I mean, because yeah. I'd done, I thought I'd done enough to do it. I'd put a good lap together. I was pleased with. It probably would have been different if I hadn't. I'd have been going like, but that's angry at myself. Like I didn't put it yeah. together. I, I just thought I put a good lap here. Yeah. If he can beat that with one chance, <laughs> he deserves it, doesn't he? You know. I mean, there would be there would be other riders, and I mean, we all know who they are. Who would have sat there, you know, you know, showing this angry face or staying? You were, and even I think they interviewed you, and you were just like, "Wow, that was great." You know, it it it, it you don't it see that. Sort of attitude to racing you know it's not a common attitude you know the kind of no, nice i think i think there's more going on though when you see the rider's face you know like i said he'd probably be grumpy because the guys did it because he didn't 
do the perfect lap, you okay, know? Yeah, yeah. And then you're angry, but you're angry at yourself more, okay. you know? Yeah. So there's, there's so many things going on. It's hard to know, you know, what the – so I was happy because I'd done all I could. I put the lap I, together I hoped I could, and if I couldn't beat Mick with that, then there's nothing I could do, you know? <laughs> he, yeah, but it was super impressive. Cool, That's yeah. it, I think. But, yeah, I know um, some people can't be happy, can they? And I, I, I think it's – I feel lucky that I can be happy for people that – other mm. people that succeed. Uh, yeah. You know, like, for example, I love seeing someone who's got a brand-new car and it's a cool one, you know? Yeah. I'll stop at the lights, wind the windows down and go, what a car. Because <laughs> <Like, laughs> they're happy and yeah. I'm happy. You know, so it's a good attitude rather than to have. If you go, sorry, it's not a, um, I don't mean to waffle on, but no. what good is going, uh, asshole's got a nice car, you know? It, it's yeah. no good for you or them. So that's how I look at it. Um, I look, okay, opposite of the spectrum. I've got a friend of mine who's a journalist in England. He, so he was sitting with Carl Fogarty a few years from now, a long time after he'd retired. And mm -hmm. uh, he said to him, Carl, you know when you were racing World Superbikes? He said, yeah. Okay, so this is a third-hand story, So, but anyway, it's a good story, so we're going to let it stay. He said, you know when you are racing World Superbikes? And Cole was like, yeah. He said, you know you were quite a right bastard at that stage. He said, I know, I was a bastard, but I was a bastard with four world championships. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that, yeah, you, I didn't win any so world championships, so maybe you have to be more that way, or it helps. Or I, I saw a foggy, foggy story for you. Um, yep. I knew Cole. Pretty pretty well, but one here's my boys just turned up. Um, I knew Carl pretty well, and uh, it's got dark here while we're talking. Okay. <laughs> I hope you can still see me. Hey, uh, yeah, we how's this? So, World Two Bikes of Phillip Island was so uh, they had so many entries. It did it in Germany as well, a couple of places uh, where they have they had an odd numbers and even numbers qualifying. You know, mm. to qualify to race. So yeah. some people didn't get to start, you know. There were so many entries, um, like double, you know, double the entries that could race. So uh, I had a different number than Foggy. It was, you know, mine was odd. Uh, mine was even. His was odd probably, number one. Um, and so Philip Island, I'm above his garage watching down, just enjoying the session because ours is, you know, later. Mm. And... Um, I, I saw him pull in the garage, and you remember Slick Bass was his mechanic? Yeah, Slick yeah. Bass, yeah. And he pulled in the garage, and I heard him <laughs> heard him say, yell to Slick, it's it's effing shit. And <laughs> Slick goes, and Slick goes, okay, what shit? And he goes, fucking everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I would think I was standing there with another rider. I was just going, how do you fix that? <laughs> <laughs> it's well, not exactly a bit of, not exactly a bit of technical feedback, you know, that the mechanic yeah. can figure out. Like, oh man! But yeah, like I said, he's one of those guys that when it uh, when the the light turns green, he just gets yeah. everything out of himself. Yeah, in the bike. Uh, a lot, a lot of people in the comments here are mentioning the name Alberto Puge. Mm -hmm. uh, give us a, yeah, okay. Give us a little bit of background here yeah, now. Um, not so much during the race, but during practices and all of that, you you seem to like putting a microphone under Mr. Puget's in Mr. Puget's face, and uh, it's my job. They're, they're quite interesting. Yeah, um, it's my job to uh, yeah. interview all the brands, you know, and I do my best to be fair. Uh, some, I mean, some struggle more than others, you know. Like I, I would like to chat to uh, Shinichi um, Sahara. Mm. more often you know but he struggles a bit he's quite shy uh hopefully he gets but so i try to do him once or twice a weekend only now um alberto the same once during the weekend because he doesn't want to do interviews but he knows he's got to give us something and so i just go okay once a weekend and then i'll try to get him on the grid as well you know unless it's going really terrible and then i'll, I'll leave him alone um but uh alberto is what oh I don't, this is a tricky one you're asking what he's like i guess you know well, yeah, okay, like because you, you tend to sort of ask questions and he has an ability to sort of 
politicize his way. This very diplomatic answer that could, that didn't answer your question in the least bit. And then you're trying to get the answer yeah. out of him. And he's trying to sort of I'm avoid it. It's a lot of fun to listen to. I've got to be honest. Yeah. It's, it's it used like to be grumpier, word. didn't it? It was grumpier, yeah. but we, we said like early, early, uh, until probably what, until this year, um, he's always been kind of grumpy and I didn't really understand why, but I just thought I got to do my job. And, um, then we sat down recently and uh, talked it out, you know, just privately sat down in his little office and went, you know, what I, both of us, um, I, I was probably giving him a hard time and he, and he um, was giving me a hard time. That's probably how, and I just wanted to know why. And uh, actually, I understood some things from his side, which is really good. And I should explain to you guys, um, he hates talking when his riders are on track. He's an ex-rider. He thinks that he would hate it if he was a rider that crashed. And my, his team manager is like talking to some TV station, you know. He just thinks it's disrespectful. He's very quite nervous i've noticed this from the start he's quite nervous when he um talks to me because he's so involved in what his riders are doing he's nervous for them he's nervous for the session will that go right or you know will the guy he's he's like a parent watching their children out on track you know which i kind of respect you know yeah. that once i understood that why he was lucky he, um he's never just personality-wise, he's never going to be Hervé Poncherel or, you know, he's, no matter how unnervous he is or how, you know, how relaxed he is. Or, he's not. He's not He's not one of those guys, you know. He's, but it was good to talk to him and get it sorted out. And there was faults on my side as well, you know. I, I was getting grumpy with him where I should – now I understand him better. I, I won't. And so, yeah, let's – Fingers crossed that the, hopefully the listeners have noticed he is trying to help more uh, lately, yeah. you know, in interviews. So long may that continue, and I'll do my best to understand his situation as well. I used to, <laughs> I, I used to always love listening to you trying to get the answer out of him. I mean, I, I love that, but I'm glad you two have kind of figured. Well, let's just say, may it come to an arrangement. I think we'll get more out of him now, which is better for us. You know, it's better mm -hmm. for. And meaning more out of him um, because when we, when him and I were going like this a bit, then he's only just, Shutting we're fighting each other. It's, mm -hmm. we're never really going to get there. We're now, he's being more diplomatic and more trying to, at least making an effort, which is great. I, I think good for, you know, less scary as well. <laughs> for me, sitting up there, I'm going, oh God, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, he, he's he's obviously very good at his job. His riders respect him, so I do, because the riders know what job he's doing, you know. So yeah, yeah. must be good. Yeah, you see, we, we don't see that background info. So like you said, when you when you kind of get to understand it and that, it, it kind of answers and, and it puts it, it things, puts yeah. front of all of us. Yeah, it puts it in perspective. Yeah. Now, we're going to get on to another touchy subject that seems to be a big talking point in MotoGP at the moment. Mark Whitehead asks, where does Simon think Maverick Vinales is going next year? The rumors were Aprilia, but the silence now makes one wonder if he might be going somewhere else. And to emphasize that question, Simon, what has gone wrong there? It seems like Maverick gets into the situation where if I'm not being looked at as number one, he kind of did it with Rossi and he's kind of doing it now being overshadowed by Fabio where he goes, okay, well, I'm not the number one guy anymore. So give me a new crew chief. Give me this. I'm going to ride at the back. I mean, that surely that Saxon ring performance was on purpose. Maverick Vinales doesn't finish last. You know, Give us your, your scope on Maverick and where you can see him going. Um, Maverick, I should start by saying, uh, I, I want to ask honest answer honestly. I should start by saying Maverick is a lovely guy to meet one-on-one. -on -one. He really is. Like, um, you know, if you bump into him in an airport or something, I say g'day to him in the paddock and nobody's around. He's a, an absolute gent, you know. Um, almost, almost a little like childlike, child, you know, because he's so genuine when he's in 
uh, I, so I mean this positive, you know, when yeah. he's saying hello to you, you know, I, he's a pleasure to meet like that in the paddock. Um, watching him like professionally, how he's dealing with this is sad because he's clearly one of the fastest guys on the mm. planet. You know, he really is. Like now, we're talking about their natural ability, you know, and work ethic thing. Um, he's one of the most natural riders for sure. Um, but he he's like the opposite of Brad, you know. Yeah. Like he's yeah. not strong here. Where you know Brad's solid as a rock, isn't he? You know, and yeah. he will always say the right thing. He'll he always get out there. And you know, when I say say the right thing, he's not Brad's not gonna bag his guys, you know, meaning say bad things about his team or as you know, anything. Um and uh mental strength is I think I'm not trying to kick Maverick, I think it's pretty obvious that it's mm -hmm. mental strength that Maverick yeah. is lacking, not not speed, not ability, you know, and um, it's sad. Uh, lots of other riders talk about seeing, you know, sports psychologists. I hope like hell the team have made him go and do that because it'll be a shame if he can't find the key, you know. It's a shame it's got to this because it's. I think it's the ride to have. Factory Yamaha right now with their bike. It's, mm. it's the right to have, you know, and to walk away with from that and a big uh, bunch of money is super sad. Hey, but uh, there's no reason why he can't. Maybe there is a dynamic that we don't know about. I, I just think that I can't see that team being anything other than supportive, you know, to its riders. They, they paid good money. They want it to work and change crew chiefs even, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, moving on from that, because it is going to end, um, yeah, where he's going to go. The scary thing is, I think the big manufacturers that are fighting for the championship are not going to want the same experience with Maverick. They will. I'm only going from what I would do if I was in their position. And I've spent quite a bit of time with these guys. I've spent a lot of time in teams. They will want to invest in someone like Raul Fernandez, uh, you know, Pedro Acosta, you know what I mean, R Remy Gardner, you know, and it, these guys coming through before, especially if they've already got a guy that's fighting at the front, you know, mm -hmm. like Yamaha have, like, but uh, um, because they're not going to want, it, it, I think it's going to take, someone like Aprilia, who will be happy with yeah. the odd win, because yeah. <laughs> they would be, you yeah. know. Yeah. And Maverick yeah. can do that. Maverick, yeah. if he's on a happy day, you know, everything's going right, he's going to make that bike do something special, which mm. I think I can understand Aprilia wanting to do that, you know. And they've yeah. got a lace who's kind of solid and doing, you know, doing well, good top uh, six, seven, that's awesome, yeah. six, seven, eight, at this particular time is damn good because there's, you know, yeah. when you look at the depth of field. So that's how I see it. I, I can't see. I mean, KTM have got the awesome lineup. They've got those guys, yeah. you know, in their contract. I go, I cringe because I'm sure Pedro Costa, uh, Raul Fernandez stuff, they're, they're going to have offers from Honda. If I was Honda, that's yeah. Mark's only, only going to last so long. You need the next Mark who's one of them, mm. isn't it? You know, yeah. or yeah. They, they need to find the next Mark and bring him on. Uh, and he's going to be cheaper now, he's one of those young guys, than he is uh, when he's already proved he can ride a MoGP bike and win, you know. So I think they'd be thinking that way before they'll think Maverick, you know. Uh, say people have talked about Suzuki, I can't see them being interested in Maverick because they got. They're loyal the way they are, you know. They're loyal, and they've already got riders for next year. And yeah. I don't think they're going to yeah. break that, you know. And I think the only reason Yamaha would break it because Maverick wants to, you know. Maverick wants to. Um, 
Hey, I hope that I know that I've probably taken too long to answer it, but that's my thoughts. No. <laughs> but well, uh, yeah. I, think, I think it'll be. I I don't want to lose Maverick from the paddock. I would love to see him yeah. do the odd special thing on Aprilia, and I I think he can. Well, it's funny because we were at the beginning of the year when we were when Rob and I was just sort of talking on these live feeds, and we were saying that Yamaha is a bit of a problem because they had Maverick and Quattararo. And at that stage, I mean, both of them had their sort of, you know, yeah, sort of issues. Yeah. 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 It seems that Quattararo's kind of gotten over it this year. I mean, he seems mm -hmm. so headstrong. And I don't – apparently he was seen as psych a psychologist. It, it yeah. seems to have done the trick. Oh, I mean, he is a year older. And uh, I've said it a couple of times on the live. I didn't think he – no, I. that's not the right words. I wasn't sure – he could do that because he was lacking something. He wasn't lacking the speed. He's never mm -hmm. lacked the natural ability. But I hadn't seen him be strong, you know, like mentally strong. And and he often I, – I'd try and get a – I mean, it was I, – I remember something at Phillip Island. I remember something at Saxon Ring, Germany. I would say three times at least – where I've gone to try and catch him because he's crashed out of a race. So my job is to try and get the guy, at least ask. Mm. And um, he's doing his nut, you know, like he's screaming, mm. you know. Mm. And I'm mm. like, he's lost the plot here, mm. you know. He's not being professional, you know. Mm. And the mm. kid, he is a kid. He's young, you know. Mm. And um, he's really impressed me this year. Like, he, all of that's gone. And I know things are going good, but – He's the, his ability to come up against problems and figure them out and overcome them without, you know, having a tantrum is mm -hmm. respect. You know, really, he's yes. come a long way in the last twelve months, I reckon. So, uh, and then uh, it's pretty obvious as well that he's going well in all conditions. You know, whether it rains, whether it, and he didn't, he wasn't a big fan of the rain. He's figured that out in in France, in Le Mans, and. Uh, yeah, good on him. He's a big threat because of that. Yeah, I, I like it because I, I touched upon he's been able to adapt himself to a hard front tyre. It just seems no matter what's thrown his way, whether the Yamaha is not working at Saxon Ring and you're not supposed to run a hard front tyre on a Yamaha, he's getting away with it. So, yeah, I agree. He's he's looking like the more complete package. It's going to be hard to stop this year. Uh, yeah. Now, Simon, this is, this is going to be a a touchy subject it's one that we brought up almost week in week now out now after motor gp races please ask someone about the yellow flag and track limit rule what what is your take on those because yes in many ways it's a good thing but in many ways it's i don't want to say destroying the sport that's a bit harsh but it's it, it's really become a big problem for riders and teams and it, it is hampering the sport in some ways well, I mean, and like the German GP, it was a case of roll the dice. You know what I mean? Are you is your fast lap going to be on a yellow flag or not? And the guy yeah. who went pole was essentially the person who missed the yellow flags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's horrible. Uh, there's so many ways to look at it. When the when the yellow flag one came out for qualifying, you know, and basically any practice lap that you're doing, and you go faster. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you, you don't roll off. And uh, there's a yellow flag out. They can prove it. You lose that lap. Um, I hated it because I know how much a rider works for that lap, meaning it's sessions. It's, he's prepared all those sessions. And I know what it was like to be out there and some – you're feeling very selfish at that moment, you know, mm -hmm. because you're trying to put that whole lap together – and you, somebody's crashed and they've got a yellow flag out there, You, I just used to think, you monkey, why now? Why crash now? It's my fucking lap, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd get so mad. Like, And basically you were allowed to – I'd get so mad if they destroyed your lap because there was stuff everywhere, meaning mm. bike on the track and you, you had to bail out, you know? But mm. what – we it used to be up to the rider until recently – that you quickly scan, you're on, you're coming in there, you see the yellow flag, you scan the track and see what's there and go, you make a judgment and go, right, no, nah, it's all right, there's nothing on the track, I can do it, you know, there's no oil flag, it's a yellow flag for someone's crash, but he's off the track, there's no people or machinery or stuff on the track, I'm keeping it going. Yeah. And, 
as a writer, that's what you want. You want to be able to do that decision. The problem is, because believe me, I said this to the race control guys, because one of them lives in the same country as me and on the same mountain as me. And the other one, Freddie, I, the other couple, I try to catch up with them a little bit on the weekend, you know, each weekend. And I'd said to them, I hate this. I, I just so, I put across to them how I want it to be a, you know, how important it is to the rider and you want to be able to keep that lap going you've been work, working for the whole weekend, you know. And they, basically, I've got explained to me that it was like that until, do you remember when Rins hurt his shoulder, you know? He'd crashed. Oh, now, was it her ref last yes, year? Yes, yes. yes. Last year, uh, if I remember right. It was uh, something like Miller had crashed Rins, and then, Rins, then Rins Rins crashed Rins. after him. And yeah. Jack came in after, right? Was the yes. other way around? I'm trying to remember. Like no, yeah. was it Jack in the gravel and Rins came in after? One yes, of them. That was Sorry, I can't remember well now. But there was marshals running around there and there was bikes flying through the marshals and it was a big wake-up call. Everyone upstairs realised that if we, unless we do something, someone's going to get killed, you know? Mm, mm, mm. And you got to think there's people that are working as marshals trying to get a bike out of the gravel and another rider crashes. And normally... What, what I didn't explain before, normally if there's a yellow flag, you can you know the speed you can go through that corner without risk of crash. Yeah. Fast, yeah. but without going like that to the point where yeah. you'll, you may crash. And that's what yeah. we used to do. But yeah. I was just explaining to you before how crazy competitive it is now. Yeah. You know, the depth of field is making – you've got to be – like that all the time, you know. Mm. And so now it's becoming more common because it's so competitive. Because you you hear hear the guys every weekend talk about how important their grid position is because their race is wrecked otherwise. Because you can't pass and uh, you know, you can't pass mm. these guys. You've got to be in front of them at the grid at the start. So they're taking more risk because of it. And the guys upstairs, race control guys, said, look, basically as I understand it, Unless they did something, someone is eventually going to get killed because a rider's crashed when there's a yellow flag, which is unacceptable. So if there's a yellow flag out, the rider has to – and from a rider's point of view, it's horrible. I hate it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I also under, begrudgingly <laughs> understand yeah. it. I know. Yeah. I mean, especially if you were the marshal or, you know, the rider mm -hmm. lying there, you know. And another bike comes through. Uh, so this is my take on that one. You know, the it's horrible. I hope they but figure a way to because the, there's riders out there regularly losing their. Hey, but this is down to teams and riders to strategize more. Meaning, you're seeing them now. Like uh, I, I saw Mir and a couple of others more and more starting early now to try yeah. and get it happen, you know, mid-session, instead of waiting till right at the end where everyone does it, there's more red, yellow flag. At the end, I think that is a better option if we have to do it this way. And like I said, begrudgingly, I agree, we have to do it this way, meaning not not risk people's lives, you know. Uh, so the, the track limits one, <laughs> man, what do you do? Uh, I think the... The guys upstairs um, are, I've noticed over the years that I've been doing this job, there's regu regular times I'll go, what the, what are they doing that for? Mm. Then I'll bump into them later and say it politely. What did you do that for? Why? What? I didn't understand that one. You know, say it politely. And they'll explain what the why, and I'll go, Ah, right, that all makes sense. But everyone on social media and uh, that doesn't know that is going, you know. <laughs> well, just recently we, we, had, we had at Aston, we had Darren Binder yeah. go three, yeah. three, penalty, three places, and yeah. they only showed us him going off the track once. So we were kind of going, huh? And I got, I, shown, I got shot, sent mm. by WhatsApp two, two shots. One was yeah. a left-hander and one was a right-hander off the track. Yeah. 
touch we, we sitting at home never find out what exactly happened. You know what I mean? And yeah. uh, maybe that's more down to the television crews, perhaps. Oh yeah, or or some. I agree because they're getting crucified upstairs. And so, hey, what what I was trying to tell you before is, for a lot of times, uh, I would go, "Why? I don't understand that." You know. Then when I got the whole story, it made sense. You're like, "Oh, that that makes perfect sense." Um, and for example, the last one was Darren, who I think I got across. I'm a big fan. You know, at at uh, Saxon Ring, mm -hmm. remember they black flagged him out of the session, mm. and uh, I think he timed it wrong because yeah. that was yeah. the first yeah. event that they were stepping up the penalty, being stricter, you know. So that's mm -hmm. part of that bummer timing, you know, for him. But the other thing was, we just saw him have the accident and crash on TV, mm. and he got black flagged, and we thought that was enough. You know, the black flag's enough penalty. You can't, you know. And then we wake up the next morning or we'll hear that later that night he's had his pit lane start as well. And I'm like, this is one of those times I go, why? That's not fair. You know, he's already been punished. And then I find out that he's picked up his bike, if I heard right, hit a rear puncture, rode on the track and disturbed KTM rider for Tech 3. Well, uh, Dennis, Dennis on on no, Japanese. Uh, oh, so, 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 Crazy boy, uh, his nickname yeah. is. Okay. Suzaki. Suzaki, yeah. Suzaki. Um, mm. Destroyed his last flying yeah. lap. Okay. And they're being really strict on exactly that. Yeah. So oh, I go, I ah, okay. right. So you, every time that I go, what are those guys upstairs doing? When I get the whole story, it makes sense, you know. I think... Yeah maximum twice i think once i remember not agreeing you know because it was uh i think it was the zako one and it, it bruno or and the other one was um anyway what i'm saying is out of 20 there's like two that i'm kind of going oh that could go either way i don't know if i agree you know the rest mm -hmm. so what i'm trying to get across here give the guys upstairs the benefit of the doubt. You know, they've yeah. got all the camera angles and they're really experienced. They're not trying to destroy someone's career, you know. But, I mean, it's it's a case of, like you said now, I mean, it was that that what happened to Darren at Saxon Ring. There was a whole long story about it. By the way, if it yeah. was Denise on you, I would have said, great, he took he, – Denise <laughs> took Darren out to Jerez. We're, we're fair, you know, it makes sense. But, uh, yeah, yeah. But, I, but here's the thing. I mean, all you hear is Darren's got to ride through penalty or pit lanes or whatever it was. But yeah. nowhere does it actually specify what he did wrong. I think that's where, for the public anyway, we're, and, and probably TV people, we need uh, someone uh, like a little politician who types it up and sends it all out to us. This is why. Uh, that would be super cool, you know. I think give um, base direction the PR department. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> someone doing that. Because, just, yeah, uh, in the meantime, given the benefit of the doubt, there's always a story behind every time I've asked, you know. Sorry, what just, was the – oh, yeah, the, the just, track limits one. Yeah, the, the track, track limits limit. one. Track limits one, yeah. Uh, I I think it's a thing – what do you call it? It's, it's work in progress, and it's not right right now. You know, they've gone from spending the guys upstairs, track race control, last year – Every time someone went off, they had to analyze it, you know, view it. And mm. if you were touching the line, you were still in. But these yeah. guys weren't getting to dinner because in Moto3, mm. they're, they're all qualifying. There's dozens of them, and they're all trying to be fair and then explain to the people. And so they just went, that's too hard. We're not making our weekend a nightmare. So we're going to do it electronically. So it's just... And there's no decision from us. It's black or white. You're in or out. And they put a little sensor on the outside of the track. And if you touch that sensor, you're out. And there's a photo to prove it. Uh, the It got taken, the photo, because you set the sensor off yeah. and you were out, you know. And uh, so that's in qualifying. Your lap is cancelled, you know. In the race... How's this, guys? Just to explain it, if I remember it correctly, in the race, you get it's four chances. 
mm. on the third time that you've set one of those sensors off or you've touched the green, um, guys, one other thing. If you go off in the race, touch the green and lose time, it doesn't go on that four. Mm. So okay. because if you've lost time, then yeah. – you, yeah, we're not going to penalize you. You've gone off the track and you've lost time. So what? Yeah. But if you use the green to your advantage, we're going to penalize you. You know, meaning meaning you didn't lose time. You stayed the same time or gained. It counts as one of those. You know, or you'll get a basically get penalized. You know, and that the the rules they've got, I think, are right. It's just. The policing of it, meaning that sensor has gone from one extreme to the other, meaning, you know, it kind of was fair because they looked at everyone and you know what I mean? And yeah. But right now it's just a black and white and maybe the sensor's too sensitive or too – but the thing is, guys, if they've got to draw the line somewhere, you know? Yeah. yeah. And the riders are never going to be happy – being penalised for riding, using too much track. All I'm saying is it's bloody hard to get a ha fair rules, you know what I mean? And they're genuinely trying to be fair because they don't count it yeah. if you lose time by going on the green. I say replace the green with grass, just like plant grass there, that it doesn't really matter anymore. Yeah, but did you see what happens if they plant grass there? Yeah. You, you did you, did you watch that American... Uh, uh, Moto America one, you know. Oh, yes. Sorry, Americans, your tracks are more primitive than the European ones, and they've got grass there on the other side of the curb, you know, yeah. not concrete, green concrete, grass colored concrete. And the this kid hit the grass. Yeah. I think maybe the curb had been a little over the curb, been worn by the car racing. You know how they use a bit more and and dig it out, so it actually dropped off the curb onto the grass a little bit, and the kid lost the rear. Horrible high side, and he's one of the front guys on the early lap. And there's mm. bikes. One guy ran over his legs, jumped up. You got to get that, you know. So, yeah. uh, I've got, I've been had by a track that the asphalt was high, and uh, was it, uh, what's it called, Sentul in Indonesia. And uh, when I went to come back on to the track in a race, trying to win it. With one one corner to go, got punted off by Kaczynski, went off the track, and when I was coming back on, I thought, I'm fine, I'm going to win this. And the step, the curb, which you don't get, sorry, it's got dark, um, the step onto the track was so high, the front went up, bang, you know, like I remember it bottoming, and the rear, because I had the throttle open, slid along, this, yeah. and went wham on its side, because I came onto the track sideways. Broke my collarbone and knocked me out. And that, that, that was your, if, if I remember correctly, that was your last race. We're going back in time again. Sorry, kids. Last nice race in Superbike, um, 97, yeah. yeah. That was your last race in Superbikes. You hadn't taken a win and you were on for the win. And I remember yeah. Kaczynski was quite an unpopular fellow after that. Yeah, I didn't, I don't feel bad about him. He was just having a, we both wanted the same spot of track. I just yeah. feel bad that, that nowadays the tracks are safer. You know, mm -hmm. that yeah. I wouldn't have crashed if there wasn't that big step. I'm not exaggerating. There's a huge step of asphalt, you know, and coming back on. The tracks are so safe now. Uh, hey, we're getting off track, but literally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, thing know, is, um, the thing is, oh, I think they're going to get it to where it is right, the policing of the green. I don't think there's anything we can do about the yellow flag thing. It's going to stay because they don't want anyone to get killed, you know. The teams have got to manage it better as in when to send their riders out. So it's not all waiting for that last moment, you know. Um, the I, I hate that they get their lap taken away. I would if I was a rider, but nothing we can do. That's going to stay. The green policing, I think, is a um, – what's a, it's, it's a work in progress, you know. Um but riders, no matter what you, they, you do, they're not going to be happy being penalised, you know? And there's always going to be this. It's just where do they put it? I, I just think, I don't know. You you know, know so, I feel sorry I, I, for them. I was talking to, to when we did the Binder interview, and my take on it is do what you're doing, fine. Like you said, it's a work in progress. 
But if you look what football and rugby and everyone have done now, they transparent with it. And that's what Don was touching upon. Yeah. If, if you are transparent with it, we, because MotoGP has become this global sport, has become just as big as rugby, soccer and everything. So we as fans with a, with a passion involved in this want to know, okay, well, why? So if race direction go, okay, Darren Binder, you did this, 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 there it is in black and white, yeah. like the soccer player that, it scores with you. a goal, and then the referee comes and says, "No, it's no goal." And the player goes, "But why? Look at the vid look at the TV there. You hit your hand, no goal. The player yeah. has no leg to stand on." With us not seeing their point of view, like you saying, we can just go, "Well, you assholes, we hate you," because totally we're agree, not seeing the picture. And I think I, I think agree. That's uh, no argument for me. I, I want the same to happen because, like I said, every time I have and. I'm lucky enough to have a channel I can at least, you know, if it's a real big question I've got, I can go and ask. And then I come back happy. And that's what the fans should have. Dead exactly. right. I agree. Exactly. So um, another touchy subject. We've got a couple more questions for you, Simon. Do you mind you if I just to... turn the light on? It's completely yeah, dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just turn the light on. <laughs> We've kept it so long, Don. It's gone dark. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> There we go. That's a bit better. See ya. Spotlight off me. There we go. There we go. That's better. Okay, you still with us? Yeah. So, yes. by the way, there, by the way, now that we can see what you look like, there people are saying you look like Liam Neeson. Just saying. Because now we can see without the mask. Sorry, once more. Look. I'm like... saying in the in the comments there are people who are saying you look like Liam Neeson. I don't know if that's a compliment or not. I'm taking it. What? Oh, okay, yeah, he's he's all right. I, yeah, he's all right. Yeah. Okay to be, no one compares me to him. Damn it! <laughs> I think that's a good thing about good thing about being 52, is you and I've got a lovely family, beautiful wife. Is I give a shit less and less. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't doing my hair before this one, so. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the compliment. Um, compliment, Liam is cool, so I'm happy. I'm happy with that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not a bad one. It could have been. It could have been a lot worse. Uh, yeah. Heinz Heinz Vorst asks here: Are eight Ducatis on the grid not an overkill? Overkill. When will Suzuki start introducing a satellite team? Do you look at it as if that should maybe be policed more? I know it would be unfair on Ducati who are, you know, taking advantage of this. But do you think there should? be a rule where, okay, Ducati, you can have maximum four or six. Suzuki, you've got to have four, Aprilia four. Um, I think, especially if, I, I agree with you. I, I don't know the political side, but I agree with you. If there was a manufacturer that only had two bikes on the grid and they wanted four, that Ducati shouldn't have eight. Yeah, I agree. Because it's only fair, isn't it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the future that happened, you know, that, mm -hmm. sorry, Ducati, we've got to, you know, limit it because Suzuki won another two bikes, Aprilia won another two bikes, and it, it, it should be there. But the thing is, uh, yeah, it did happen this year, you're right, because, mm -hmm. no, no, I don't think it quite happened this year. Suzuki weren't ready, and Aprilia admitted on the live to me, you know, um, Massimo Rivola, that they weren't quite ready anyway, you know. Mm. Mm. Um, he didn't say it in exactly those words, um, mm. but he said they were already stretched doing what they're doing. And so it's not, you know what I mean, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the yep. thing is, when, when Suzuki, um, Yamaha have already got it, but when Suzuki, Aprilia uh, want to, I think there should be, and they're ready, uh, there should be room made for them. Yeah, totally agree. But I think at the moment there isn't, so that's why, you know, knock yourself out, boys. Get another <laughs> Um, Hey, one thing I've thought about, I should tell the listeners, is that it's going to be a nightmare for the non Ducati riders, mm. uh, especially the inline, you know, the Yamahas and Suzukis, probably Aprilias as well. But... Riders always say that the Duke is a nightmare to pass, you know, because it's so fast and straight the line and they slow it down more in the turns. Um, but multiple Dukes is much worse because 
you can imagine coming onto the straight at Qatar and you're trying to stay in the slipstream of this guy so you can pass him on the next infield lap and you're going to, your plan is to pass him on the infield, you know, but then as soon as you get on the straight, you can't quite stay in another two Dukes come past and then <laughs> stop you even more and now that guy's two, three bikes up. Yeah. Can you imagine how hard that's going to be? Oh. Yeah. And we're going to see yeah, that yeah. next year, next year more. You this know, is, uh, yeah, Ducati's doing a hostile takeover. The way they're going to help Jack Miller is by putting more bikes to hold up Maverick Vignoles. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I like it. I like it. Um, um, no, I think um, one thing is KTM mm -hmm. are doing an amazing job of bringing the talent through, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. aren't they? You know, their talent mm -hmm. conveyor belt of talent heading towards MotoGP. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this is Ducati's effort as well, yes. you know, mm -hmm. is the more guys they've got on their bikes, the more chance, you know, they're, they're, and they're bringing more young fellas through, which is, which is good, you know. They're at, so, they're at a disadvantage. They can't, they don't have Moto3 and Moto2, any of that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think um, the, the KTM is going to be the last question we're going to ask you because that's going to be a, a nice talking point for us with the, the, the brand involvement. Um, Stephen Berry is one of our our top smart guys, we can call him here. He's, uh, a know -all. He's the one that's always like, correcting us when we say yeah. something. Like, well, actually, no. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's our Simon Crayfar in South Africa. So he asks here, oh, yeah. it's, a very, it's a very important question because it, I feel bad for Juan Mir. He is MotoGP World Champion, but I don't know how you feel. When I watch the racing, I don't see him as MotoGP World Champion. And when I do debriefs with some of the riders afterwards and they talk about Mark Marquez, they still very much talk about him as the champion. And then you kind of go, oh, no, but actually Jean Mir is the champion. And Stephen's question here is, do you think Suzuki are missing Davide Brivio? Uh, I mean, they're bound to be missing him. I should start first with Juan Mir. Um, I I try not to be biased, but I love him. Yeah, and I do. Yeah. yeah, on the bike and off the bike, how clever yeah. he is! How uh, that balance that I'm always talking about, the natural uh, ability and work ethic, is there. He's so clever. Uh, he rides so well. Like mm. I'm a huge fan, and uh, I don't think we've seen all uh, everything of him. I think he's going to be a right pain in the ass for a lot of riders for years to come. I think Juan is even better. I said it on the live. Uh, he's even better this year than he was last year, riding wise. I just think Suzuki have lost the edge um, that they they were at least on a pretty equal footing last year you know, with their advantages and disadvantages versus others, where this year they've lost ground because they're the only one not having that rear squat device. Yeah, the device yeah. I'm not talking about off the start. I'm talking about every lap off the slow turns onto the long straights. They use that to drop the rear. And mm -hmm. like at Germany, I saw that the last turn, I've ridden it on for that GoPro lap and uh, a couple of years ago, and on a stock 1,000, Stock thousand, which is like way slow compared to what they're on. You can't keep the front wheel on the ground out of the last turn at Germany, uphill and then over yeah. a brow in second gear. It's impossible that even the beamer are swerving, trying to figure out how to keep it on. I hate anti wheelie because it, it's just anti -power. The power. it's anti power, mm. you know, it's like cuts the power. So I was trying to figure out how to get it. And can you imagine at that corner? Yeah, all the bikes are dropping the rear, which lowers the engine, or lowers the center of gravity, and you get less wheelie. The mm. Suzuki's losing two tenths just out of that corner, maybe mm. three by the end of the straight, you know, two tenths mm. short. And then the rider, that's one passing point into that straight. There's not a passing point again until the last turns again. So mm. he's only got one spot to pass, and he, all I'm saying is Suzuki are uh, at a disadvantage at the moment. And Juan is still getting it on the podium last week. He's mm. he's awesome. I genuinely believe that. I think as soon as Suzuki give him enough to match the others, you're going to see him like he did the end of last year, you know. I, I think podium regularly 
and some wins. He's damn good. That's my I opinion. Should, um, I should rephrase that 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 question that that little comment I made. It's not that I don't see him as MotoGP world champion, and I actually wanted to see your point. Do people in the paddock see him as the MotoGP world champion? Because it just doesn't. It doesn't feel like he's got that, you know, when the commentators and that talk, and we love the commentators, but when everyone talks about Juan Mir, we don't talk about him as MotoGP world champion. It just doesn't have that no, same feel. I think that him. is because they are struggling so much this year mm. at their disadvantage. Mm. If he was on the podium every week, people would be talking about him more often, yep. but he's yep. just off. Or he's yep. at Germany, was way off, but he's normally just off, you know, mm. and mm. even with the disadvantage at the moment. Um, so, no, you're right. If nobody's looking at him, but what I'm saying is, don't forget him. He is good. That's my advice. He is really good. He's at a disadvantage at the moment, um, and when he gets it back, we'll, you'll see it. Uh, that's my my feel, take on it. You don't have to agree. Um, David Abrevio, you're always going to miss a guy like that, always, because it's kind of like the glue to hold everyone together and do a little bit of ass kicking, but do it in a good way. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. You're always going to miss someone well, like that. We, but, we've seen that it's, it's a big part in MotoGP now in in the Vinales situation, keeping riders happy. Like you said, Brevio, be, finding that balance between Stern, we're paying yeah. you, do a job, but keep him happy. I mean, that's got to be hard. Sure. Yeah, exactly right. And well, David uh, is super experienced at that. I remember I met him in ninety. I think it was ninety five. Um, Colin Edwards writing for him, um, and uh, per Perovino, remember back, yeah, back yeah. as far as those days, um, 90, 94. I reckon I met him there, 95. Um, worked with him only once, Suzuki Eda, Hager, and I rode together, so worked with him there and really impressed. Really nice guy, um, so like a like a polished, uh politician you know but yeah. very likable yeah. <laughs> you know yeah, I, I went away I'm like a politician he's, he's so clever you know <laughs> that's what i had to add the likable <laughs> 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 but really like i genuinely liked him after working with him that weekend because he was he's just smart really really intelligent and uh, good with people so they're going to miss him how much the results uh, change. I think they'll miss him when uh, times are tough or there's fallouts with riders, like you're saying, uh, because things are easy when things are going well. You know, mm -hmm. it's just when times are tough, they're going to miss him for sure. You know, mm -hmm. like some fallout between the riders or team staff. Or, but I think at the moment, everyone, when he left, had their position. They're all good at their job. Yeah, and it's working. You know, um, he left him at a base. Yeah. Yeah, so I think until things turn bad, they won't really miss him. It'll uh, that uh, the you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we've had comments about fifty comments about this. There's a there's a gentleman. He's quite well known. He's racing MotoGP. Uh, his name's Valentino Rossi. <laughs> <laughs> Might have heard of him once or twice. Um, okay, similar to like the Maverick question. Um, what? Is is there a problem there? I mean, in terms of like, you know, he's got a problem. He got a genuine problem with the bike, or problem trying to sort something out, or is it just, is it sort of his time now? I mean, must he? Should he be calling it quits? What well, do you? I'm only, I'm only guessing. It's only my opinion. But the the problem is he's um he's getting old, you know, mm -hmm. and it happens to all of us. That, that that he's brilliant, man. He's oh, He's another one I love on and off the bike, you know. Yeah. He welcomed me back to MotoGP. He's got his talent of remembering names, and he's so good with people. He, he's super clever um, that I was struggling my first year, you know, doing this job. I didn't know what I was doing and making lots of mistakes, and that's a horrible feeling, doing it in front of lots of people, getting a <laughs> kicking on social media and all that. At my first race, Qatar, uh, I'd just given all my equipment back going, you know, walking upstairs and he came down from after the podium or after press conference or whatever. And I, so I met him on the stairs. He's with his entourage and someone, and uh, he stopped, said, ciao, Simon. And he put his hand on my shoulder and said, 
good to see you back where you belong in the paddock, you know? And then he yeah. as quick as just wandered off. I mean, he made me feel so special in that moment, you know, like right when I was feeling shit, I needed it. <laughs> um, but so you understand why I respect him hugely, you know. I met him when he was 13 or 14. Um, uh, his dad, you know, at a party, believe it or not, boot sponsor, and uh, he chatted away asking me about Graham Crosby because his dad was teammates with Graham Crosby. I know Graham. I'm a mechanic for him when I was starting out in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, do you know him? So we shared funny stories about uh, Crosby because Crosby is a funny guy. Um, and then he went, oh, this is my son, Valentino. You know, he wins all the scooter races. And Valentino just said, ciao, have you got any stickers? <laughs> <laughs> That's when I first met him in Imola, that was. Hey, so I know we're getting off track, but Go for it's it. just time. That's all it is. It's like mm -hmm. he, you can't beat these young boys. That's why I'm a big fan of them, you know, coming through from Moto2. Um, and it's time, I think. Hey, one thing to throw in is an example that I believe will help you understand, I think, what's going on with Valentino is remember last year, Ducatis couldn't do anything, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. They won one race in Austria. Uh, Zarco did a, quite a few uh, very impressive rides. In the mall um, with the picture, yeah. But, but uh, sorry, um, then uh, Jack a couple... Uh, but never the same rider, uh, mm. you know, consistently. And and Pico was stunning when he was on form. Mm. But it became clear that it was the young guys, or at least the new generation, that could figure out how to use the Ducati. Mm. And the more experienced, you know, the factory guys on the Dukes couldn't, you know. Mm. And mm. I relate that to what I mentioned before is I – I rode Michelin early on. I managed to get a podium in superbikes on Michelin's, but my career came good when I changed the Dunlops and mm. I figured out how to use them. I got better. By the time I got on Michelin's, I was knocking on 30 and I couldn't change me mm. Mm. back. Mm. And it's the young guys that who haven't got the experience and haven't already formed how they do things. Mm. Yeah. that figure out the way – and Ducati have put young boys on the bike, young riders, new generation, and they're flying again, you know, mm -hmm. because they figured out how to use it. And the other boys are more set in their ways, you know. That's mm -hmm. what I think. And what's I think it's the same thing that ha happens and what is happening to Valentino, you know. They're, the young guys are figuring out how to use that bike a different way that hasn't been done before or it's not the old way. You know, and that's what happens. Like, it's sad when you're in that position. I was, but if you can't figure it out after a year or so, then it's the young boy's turn. You know. Mm. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. I like it. Like you said, you get you get cast in stone in many in many ways, and it's sometimes hard to break yourself out of that stone, which is because it worked. It worked for years. Exactly. It worked for me for years to ride a certain way. It's worked for Valentino unbelievably well for a long time. And it's hard to change your ways, you know. And uh, they're often talking about bike setup, you know, that mm. Yamaha has seen it works for the other riders. They've got results this way. Try and force Valentino to put it on, but it doesn't work for him. He goes back and he goes faster, but not quite fast enough. So this is my, only my opinion from watching, but I think it's all it is, you know. And it, like I said, happens to all of us. Hopefully you can have one more. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's that's what we all. That's what you know. And I think he, I think he, he deserves it. And I think it would just be, it would be like the perfect script. Hang on, can you imagine Masano, Valentino Rossi winning at Masano, <laughs> where the whole the whole Adriatic even, coast will just fall into the ocean. It will even on a podium. Explosions, you know what I mean? Even, even on the podium, no, a podium would would be cool. Um, yeah. I don't think we'd even yeah. remember who won. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Simon, so, with your with your ties in in World Superbike, I don't know, you know uh, if you still watch World Superbikes now and that. Um, yeah. I want to get your thought on uh, Mr. Johnny Ray first of all. Who I you know I watched him and Top Rack on the weekend at Donington, and the way they ride their motorcycles is spectacular. Johnny 
is a phenomenal rider. I wa I've been watching him from his BSP days, 16 years old on a Red Bull yeah. uh, Honda. Yeah. First, first, first part of the question is, do you, I mean, I would have personally loved to have seen a, a Johnny Ray had a real good shot in, in MotoGP. How do you think he would have done? And what do you think of, of this new top rack kid? And would you think his riding style would work on a MotoGP being, being that wild and aggressive? Or do you think that's just how you have to ride a world superbike compared to a MotoGP bike? Uh, I think you can get away with being more aggressive on a superbike, for sure. You have to be more smooth on a Grand Prix bike. Um, oh, let, we'll start with Johnny. Um, that's a good question about Johnny because he's an obviously phenomenal rider. Um, it, I would have really liked to, like everyone, seen him go to MotoGP. Um, but like all of us that have gone from Superbike to MotoGP, you have to take a risk and um, even a, you know, you can't go straight to a factory bike normally. You've got to go satellite team, you know, as long as it's a good satellite team, you can prove you can do something and you're burning a year or so learning and you have to take a pay cut. And, uh, but to me, it was worth the risk because it was, um, I went to, I got offered it and I went to the, I mean, I went to the gym and I was thinking the next day or so, should I take it? And I, first of all, thought Troy Corsa went to the same team. Nori Haga went to the same team. They're very good, very good on Superbike. And they're coming back kind of with their tail between their legs back to Superbike. Mm. And I was like a bit worried. That's why I said, give me some time to think about it. Mm. I knew it was a big risk, but mm. I went to, uh, you I don't know if you follow motocross, but the King brothers, I grew up with them in New Zealand motocrosses and I was, went to Belgium training in the gym with them. And the gym that gave us free training, you know, there was because he was, was a bike fan and he had, uh, apart from motocross pictures, he had Norikabe on the wall, really, really cool poster of Norikabe. And um, I, I looked up at it and went, I was sixth in the uh, Superbike Championship last year. Nori Haga, sorry, it was uh, Norik Abe, sorry, Norik Abe. Abe. Norik Abe up on the wall there was sixth in, in Grand Prix. Everyone knows who Norik is. Nobody knows who I am, you know. Yeah. Grand Prix yeah. is the ultimate. So I yeah. went. The other thing was I told my wife was I don't want to be 40 and wonder if I could ride one, figure it out. Yeah. You know, it was, that was for me. So I'm going to take the risk. What do you reckon? And she was like, yeah. If that's what you want to do, let's go. And so I rang them and said, let's do it, you know. And I, I told them, if, I, if it's the same money I've got in Superbike, I'll do it, you know, uh, because I wasn't on that great money in Superbike because I was from New Zealand, you know. They don't sell many bikes or helmets, uh, leathers in, in uh, New Zealand. And uh, and so we did the deal when we did it. The thing is, it's a big risk. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, Johnny wasn't prepared to take that risk and i don't even mind that johnny hears me say that he wasn't and i'm not saying he was right or wrong mm -hmm. i'm just saying he wasn't prepared to he went let's go this safe route that has been extremely successful for him you know mm -hmm. and i bet it uh definitely more chance of filling the bank up you know that's yeah. for sure because yeah, the yeah. Grand Prix one is a bigger risk that yeah. will you figure it out? Will you get the right ride in the end? Um, will you get hurt? The guys, the, the level of riders is another step, the another you know, depth of field. So that's the take on Johnny. I we never gonna know because he wasn't prepared to take the risk or he made the right decision for him and he's uh gonna be happy ever after. Um about uh sorry, the other one, top rack, yeah. a huge fan. I, uh, yeah, you'd have to smooth it out a bit because these things will flick you off if you ride him like that. But he is, I don't know the guy, but I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's a, an athlete. He's an athlete, isn't he? Uh, like, I, I follow him on uh, social media and you see his uh, kickboxing stuff or Muay Thai, yeah. what he's doing. I used to do that for training and shit, look at him go. He's brilliant. He's obviously training hard. 
he's fantastic to watch on the bike, and I was so sad to hear that he wasn't going to come to GP. Uh, mm. But again, for whatever reason, he's decided two more years in uh, in uh, Superbike. But I hope we get to see him in in, in Grand Prix. To just uh, touch upon that question a little bit more, we saw Garrett Gerloff, and we've seen a couple of guys come from World Superbikes to MotoGP, and you know you can't really judge them on one race. But is there is there this massive difference between MotoGP and World Superbike? Because we see Superbike riders come in and sometimes battle. Like you know, Gerloff actually didn't do too bad, but we've seen it. But then we see the other end of the spectrum where Tito Rabat goes to World Superbike and just can't make it work. And we've seen MotoGP riders go. Batista did a fantastic job, but now he's struggling. I mean, is it at the end of the day, we see a motorcycle with two wheels, brakes, and a throttle. But it seems to be this massive, you know, you throw in the Michelin and the Pirellis, you think, but they're tires. How can they be so different? Yeah. But they seem to be worlds apart. That's a really good question about um, Tito, because I really thought Tito would take it to them. Yeah. And yeah. I, he doesn't live far from here, but and this summer I'm going to ask him when I bump into him, I'm going to ask him what's going on because he's always more, you know. What I can say is um, Reading's having a tough time as well, isn't he? And he's not happy setup-wise or something with a bike. I know Tito's on a Duke as well. Maybe they've got some – the Dukes aren't there at the moment. Yeah. And they've got yeah. good guys on them. So maybe they've got lost. Something's happened there. Be be great to – I last Tito what what happened, but um, yeah, Bautista was going great. Uh, who knows whether it's personal or or the bike's not a hundred percent or uh, anyway, I don't know. Um, but um, about Gerloff coming to GP, I do know better, and that is you, you can't judge someone on. Um, such a short run on those things. He was at a track. Like, for example, I remember saying on the live at Essen that uh, Alex Marquez said in his debrief on Thursday or Friday night, no, Friday or Saturday night, that this is the hardest track that he's come to as a rookie on a GP bike, you know, Essen. He said it's so narrow and it's hard, so hard to find the line exactly and you've got to find the line exactly to do the lap time, you know, and stay on the track. And um, then I thought, Gerloff's never been here. <laughs> Alex Marquez has been here for years. Gerloff's never been here, and he's got an I mean, GP bike as well that he's never ridden in the dry. I mean, against, like I keep saying, the depth of field is mental. How <laughs> could, you know, 20th, the, the guys in 20th are awesome. So, yeah, I, I you definitely can't judge uh, Garrett Gerloff on one uh, on that. You, you, he needs a season, you know, on those things. So, I mean, that's why it's such a big risk as well for the Superbike guys to come in because they're going to get their ass kicked for a while. And then, then when you, six months, you know, what, half season in, then you're going to see if they're figuring it out or not. Mm. But you've got to take that risk and to, to know. I think it's also kind of um, difficult for World Superbike riders to get into MotoGP. On the ground set, there's so many, so many talented riders in Moto3 and Moto2. And, and if they you're know it works. Bring yeah. them up. They know it works. Yeah. They know it works. If you're, you've got a, you're running a MotoGP team. You need a rider for next year. I mean, are you really going to try and risk taking a World Superbike rider across? Um, I, think, I, I think politics comes in as well in that um, if you've got a race in that country – a TV is big in that country. Yeah, it's really important to have a rider from that country in there. I, I yeah. know the riders that have the, the places that have races. Um, the riders get helped, you know, yeah. from Dorna. The teams are helped to take them, you know. Like it's been like that for British riders for as long as I was. I've been around, you know. Well, there was a story that uh, Jake Dixon might take one of the Patronus seats. And, okay, dare we say it, it's not really because he deserves it. It's because they, you know, it's possible Dorna wants a British rider in, in the top class. Yeah, and it's important. That's what I'm saying. It's important for the series that there's a ride. If there's a race in that country, you know, the TV's big in that country, that it's important to have a rider from that country. They try to help, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, like I said, it's been like that since I was uh, in the paddock. So um, it's actually one of the reasons that 
when I hear British uh, people say, oh, it's all Spanish and Italian, and if you're not, and I'm like, bullshit. Oh, yeah. like, can you imagine when I was trying to make it in the paddock and teams would say, you're from England, aren't you? And I'm like, no. And they're like, oh, and then they're not interested oh. anymore. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, where do you live? Yeah, and, you know, it's so uh, you know the the writers from those countries get help, and they always have, they always will at least one, you know, and um, it's good, it's a good thing because it helps bring them through, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Speaking about that same thing is, people say, oh, if you're not Spanish or Italian, the problem is, I would hate to be me coming up if I was Spanish or Italian right now. Yeah. They've got so many that you have mm -hmm. to be brilliant to even get looked at, you know. Yeah. So I think it's harder. You'd be much better off to be British or American because yeah. you're going you're gonna to get noticed. <laughs> That's true. But, yeah, true. Yeah. So it's, it's a fair bit of bullshit about that. <laughs> yeah, we, we always say uh, I, I want Joe Roberts or um, uh, what's his name, Bobby. I'd, I'd love one of them and to start winning, especially because – you know, it's great to see the Americans win. You know, they're they're pretty cool when they win. But also, every single time an American wins, we get a cool documentary. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, yeah, like exactly, Joe Roberts, uh, uh, Gerloff. Um, I hope one of them gets the opportunity. It's it's good. It's better for the sport as well if there's lots of different nationalities in there. You know, uh, I'm just saying it's it's true that uh, I wouldn't want to be Spanish or Italian right now. Like I wouldn't have what it takes to stand out in the beginning to get picked up, you know, because mm. you'd mm. take a bit more time, whatever. And the, the kids are coming from so young, so good that, yeah, it'd be really hard to get an opportunity. Anyway, yeah, um, but there's, yeah, a lot of good kids coming through Moto2. So, but what, sorry, one other thing about your question, Moto Superbikes, because of uh, Top Rat, where he comes from, I think it's really big. Yeah. It's a massive population, uh, big mm. TV, and mm. they've got a beautiful track. I've ridden it really good. So I reckon he'd be in line. I, I don't know the politics side, what's going on, mm. but I reckon he'd have a good chance of getting some help in, you know, and uh, mm. and he's got the talent. So yeah. I hope he gets a chance. Girl off same. So there's two guys from Superbike that have a good opportunity, you know, a good possibility because of where, they, where they're from and – their ability. Cool. Okay, Simon, we've got a we've got a couple more questions. Don, you got one more question, and then I've got two last final questions for you, Simon. Because everyone is is loving this so much, you're going to have a lot more followers tomorrow on. on oh, all cool. Your, yeah. They're and all South Africa. Africa. <laughs> um, I want to know. Okay, and this is maybe nowadays it's quite an obvious question. Is um, who's your who, who who would be your bet for the future? I mean, at the moment, we've got the Marquezes of this world, uh, the likes of Pedro Costa, Raul Fernandez. I mean, are they what do you think? I mean, is should Marquez be looking over his shoulder? Well, it happens to everyone, like I was saying. Um, you know, there's only so long you can, everyone's different, but you can keep it going at the top. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know how long Mark's got, you know. He's, I think he's still got some brilliance in him. He's going to be around for a while more. And uh, But, yeah, there are always going to be those new young fellas coming through. And for the reasons I was saying, they can adapt and get something more out of the bike. The old boys are set in their ways, you know. Um, but, yeah, there's a heap of talent coming through. I'm really excited about Remy Gardner moving up. I've been, been a believer of Remy for a while before he was – doing too much, you know. Um, I've been kind of um, at least saying that I believe in him to people that, uh, you know, managers, managers and stuff. So, but, yeah, then we're going to see hopefully Darren coming through, Binder. Um, there's obviously Fabio Antonio is moving up um, as well on a Duke, uh, Grassini, then... Uh, yeah, the, the, those two standout ones are ones I men, uh, mentioned before. Hey, one other thing, guys, is the two young Spanish guys, you know, unbelievable, Pedro Acosta and uh, Raul. I think some manufacturers will be uh, waving 
the checkbook at their managers because I think it'll be cheaper to get them now and pay penalties pay. to keep the end. Does Alberto Pugh sleep outside Pedro Costa's hotel room? I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, if I was Honda, I'd definitely try and get those boys who one of them, you know. Um, anyway, um, but you know, the sad thing is there's quite a few. Moto 2 is so cutthroat and so. If you haven't figured every little thing out, you're not going to show me. And there's a couple of guys that I can't believe. You know, two years ago, uh, Lorenzo Baldessari, mm. you know, I was, I would have put money on him getting through the MotoGP. You know, yeah. he was winning. He could show that he could manage tyres and it's just fallen off a cliff, you know. Mm. And I'm like really gutted for him. Um, so there's guys that I really think could make it in MotoGP that aren't going to get the opportunity because it hasn't gone right in Moto2. You know, you know what I'm saying? It did yeah. for a while and then it's disappeared. So I think it's really important to have the right team behind you and figure out how to use those tyres and because it's a really, really cutthroat class. So there's going to be a few that I'm really sad that are not going to make it. And now you're seeing Joe Roberts have a – stutter a stumble you know and uh because at the end of last year it was looking or Aprilia offered him a deal didn't they you know mm -hmm. and uh it's one of those classes that it's so cutthroat so yeah and it, it's sad that some of those boys won't you know yeah you're talking about marquez i mean how long is he gonna last we saw uh there was this as you said at taiwan two years ago he had the massive hard side and then immediately was faster now we're seeing acid. He has a big hard side, and it and it knocked him. It it genuinely, you know, and that is something that happens. I mean, he's still fast. He's still going to be fast, but he has got. I think there is that little thing going on where a big hard side like this now That's is a really, really good point. Yeah, yeah, I saw the same. Um, it really did knock him around. Hey, but to be fair, um, I think the the Honda has lost ground on the other manufacturers. Uh, just mm -hmm. like Suzuki has a little bit lately, Honda has, over the last two years, lost ground on the other manufacturers. So, it and he is um, not one hundred percent physically, and his confidence has taken a battering. You know, so mm -hmm. it's totally understandable that you know it almost happens again. And uh, he got up the next morning. Apparently, was like struggling to get on the bike. You know, like really really knocked around. Um, yeah, and you're talking about two different periods, aren't you? Mark was on form and the bike was closer to the others than it is now, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we, we touched upon it earlier. You said the Honda was closer. Mark's won the titles for however many years now. But like you said, I think it was more him polishing a turd as we kind of call it in South Africa <laughs> making making the bike look better than it actually was and yeah. the accident not only chinked his armor because he always used to bounce back physically but it also put a huge dent in Honda going well shit we actually weren't as close to our rivals as we thought Mark was just riding the bike past its potential and winning on it uh, yeah it's just really proved that um what the other riders were saying, you know, on the Honda, that, that it's not, there's some things not right. And it was only Mark that could figure it out. But yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know what more to say that, that I agree, you know, but now Honda's got a little bit further away. Maybe they got the power because the bike power was down a bit and they got it back, mm. but it seemed more difficult to ride, you know, and then only Mark could ride it. And now, you know, almost nobody can ride it. Mark occasionally. I, I expect um, Alex, if his confidence and Tucker, it seems like the Honda works at Aragon to be strong there. You know, it seems like it works there, mm. like it does at uh, Saxon Ring with Mark. So, yeah, I think we'll still see some results from Honda at places like Aragon. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, Honda know now at least that they can't put their all their eggs all in one basket, you know. And believe only one guy because, uh, yeah, they're going to be left like it is now. Uh, Rob, are you going to ask the KTM question? 
We're, we're gonna I, have to. I, if we carry on any longer, we're gonna have to have like an intermission <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the KTM question. That's gonna be the last question. Second last question. <laughs> you've you've uh, been in a paddock. You've been teammates with Hager, Gobert. You've ridden, raced against Fogarty, Duan. Who is the craziest bastard over your years of racing? Where every time you went to the paddock, you went this fucking guy again <laughs> you know what i mean who's, who's that crazy like i know Haga from what we've seen him here in south africa you know we saw this guy that raced the motorcycle incredible but he got off he smoked he got in a jacuzzi with chicks you know you touched upon go but who's that crazy bastard that you went every race when you went how is this guy so fast when he's just that stupid actually <laughs> i'm gonna ask my wife because i don't <laughs> nobody leaks out hey the, the good thing is um as you move up the championships, meaning from club to national, then to international, you know, then to world championship, those guys drop away, you know? Mm -hmm. The ones you don't trust drop away because they crash or they, you know, they didn't. So in general, I have no feelings of anyone, to, but I don't hold a grudge. So maybe I'll ask my wife if I used to complain about someone. Did I kiss? No. Just some people didn't train and yeah. Really hard. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Nobody that I thought was crazy as in dangerous to ride against because you left them behind at national level, I'd say. The last time I saw probably guys like that would be at BSB or um, at home in national, you know, uh, not at World Championship. It's, it's, yeah, better than as you move up. Nobody wants to – they're all too smart to do crazy stuff, you know. Um, but you're talking about uh, super bike days. Super bike days, um, the after parties were good, you know, in motorhomes and stuff. Oh, brilliant. I remember being so hungover, Gobert was part of the problem. <laughs> but it was – I can't remember who else was there. It was a bunch of us in – uh, my motorhome and Go, Goey's motorhome at Austria, so Salzburg ring back then. And I was so sick the next day that it's the only time Kirst driven all the way back to base from the circuit. <laughs> so Austria back to uh, Bergamo near Milan. And I spent the whole trip on the sofa. Green. <laughs> 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 but yeah, superbike days were good for that. And I think it, you're right, it was a little bit different era. So if we were in Japan, for example, at Sugo, um, the place got a hammering that Sunday night, you know, because it, it's a uh, nobody saw heading off on private jets or something. We're all, we're, the whole paddock is stuck in Sugo. We used to call it Sugo concentration camp um, <laughs> because everybody's there. You know, and uh, nobody's – it's a bus to town sort of thing, and everyone is – it was brilliant. Sunday nights were magic. But, yeah, the more professional it is, it depends what you want, you know, because Superbike Paddock guys would say, oh, it's better in Superbike. We're more relaxed and friendly. And uh, um, The way I see it is it's just like going from a little school to a big school. It's more or less the same thing. It's just you don't know everyone because there's three world championship classes there and maybe support classes. Um, and I quite like that. You know, you you met more people. It was, And the cream, not all, there's some good guys in Super, but the cream of the engineers and stuff normally end up at um, Grand Prix. Like I said, not all, but... Yeah. The depth oh. of that knowledge yeah. is amazing. I, and I felt that people are more or less the same, meaning uh, they're just as happy to have a beer and rah, but the more money involved, the more professional it is, the less relaxed people are about, you know, they're, they're more trying to do their job as good as possible. So, But you still have a beer with them, and it's the same. That, that's how I feel. It's like... Mm. Just a small school, bigger school. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to get to this um, this KTM question that everyone's been asking, and th there's going to be we're going to we're going to ask you to dissect it a little bit um, because we've got our Brad Binder on it. 
So one of the big questions that everyone was asking is, do you think KTM and Brad Binder are close to winning a world title? That is the Most first me. part of MotoGP, yeah. That is the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, do you think KTM have gone the right way by sticking to their guns with, you know, the trellis? Now it's a beam trellis, W suspension, not just going the, let's put Olin's on it, let's go um, Suzuki, Yamaha frame, and let's do it that way. The, the second part of that, uh, about the frame and the suspension, I actually asked Pitt Byra, beginning of last year, right in their kind of lull at Hareth, I hassled him about that. I went, you know, because it wasn't working. And I totally thought, they're nuts. What are they trying to do? Like reinvent the wheel? Because I'm, I'm just a racer. I love the engineering side. I was a mechanic by trade. And um, and uh, Olin's technician when I retired. So I, I love the engineering side. I, I really appreciate it. But I'm a racer at heart. I'm at a race track. You just want to put in what works and race, you know? The, the development's up to the test team. <laughs> they can do that. Race has yeah. got no patience for the development that you just want to put in something that works better, go faster, move up the grid, you know? And I, I just thought, what are they doing? What? And they totally blew my mind that they – win and won races so soon with you know the only ones having a trellis frame and wp suspension i'm going wow so they shut me up <laughs> like, I was, like wow so and they had more grit obviously at bruno where there was no grit and with their trellis frame and wp they had grit everyone's on the same tires so they were doing something right you know there and um Brad won, and great. Uh, is the second part of the question, um, Br uh, Brad, close to honestly answer? No, he's not close to winning World Championship right now. It's only his second year in the class. Um, if you think about his teammate, Miguel, hits his third year in the class. He's got another year's experience. The bike wasn't good. That first year he rode, I felt sorry for him, but he still – gained knowledge in that time you know and um so you're really gonna see brad i think next year his third year in the class that's who i think he'll have his, enough experience knowledge you know uh made the mistakes enough to start to really shine you know like miguel is this year that's the way i look at it um and then next year ask me the same question you know <laughs> and see what he's learnt in that 12 months from now. That's the way I see it. This class is so hard. Like I said, there's the depth of field, but everything the rider has to manage, you know, through qualifying and then into the race, all those switches and manage front tyres and rear tyres and, and try and race and battle. And, yeah, you need a few years to, to be able to do it. I mean, even Fabio, as brilliant as he was, um, like I said, he was going up and down, you know. He's super mm -hmm. fast, but up and down. And he was on – Fabio will hate me for saying this, but I think he was on the bike that is the quickest one to adapt to. I'm not going to say easiest because none of it's easy, but the quickest one to yes. adapt to the Yamaha coming from Moto2, you know. The V4s, mm -hmm. I think, are more of a nightmare to – to adapt to because they're cool, further away style wise, yeah. Uh, the Moto Two style. So, give Brad that other twelve months. Well, you know, next year I will expect to really see what Brad can do by midway well, next year. Yeah, I mean, last week we spoke to Brad and he actually said much the same thing. He said he remembers oh. being in Moto Two, the second year in Moto Two, where he thought, "Now I should be winning," and he was actually sitting there, come finish finishing if he was lucky, top 10s. And he also remember sat there thinking, you know, what am I doing? And it was if you remember last, well, this last year in Moto2, which was his third year, and, I mean, he was on a bike that wasn't working very well, but still riding the wheels of the thing to get yeah, up there. It was amazing, and it's exactly yeah. what you're saying is sort of what he said last week. Yeah. Which is 
I yeah. think that's that's the only that, to be fair to him. That's the then we're really going to see. Do I believe Brad's got it? Yes, I really do. He's got what I'll say it again that magic, um, natural ability, you know, and work ethic. Um, is, I would say the most professional rider. I listen to all the debriefs, and he's to me the most professional rider, you know. Um, he's really strict on himself. The what everything he says, uh, he never blames. He and I genuinely believe that is his way of working. He doesn't blame his tools or his men, you know, behind him. He blames himself for not figuring it out. And uh, like I said, the good guys always um, are their own harshest critics, you know. And he's the whole package, Brad. So I'm not I, saying it because yeah, you're yeah, that, that's a South Africa. <laughs> I wouldn't seem say, to say anything to. I don't believe. So. Oh, no. <laughs> no, you're lucky. We don't have to send our over to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hey, okay, is that so was, it? was it? That was the last question. I think my, my yeah, kids yeah. are all starving. <laughs> yeah. No, I better that's get a Um. I just want to ask you, the with all your knowledge, your technical knowledge, how many times do you get that garage door slammed in your face when you're trying to look at Honda, look, changing everything? Does it happen often or are they very accommodating? No, more and more because we're, we've done a couple of articles lately. You know, the the uh, the one on the new the new Honda at Hareth test, you know, on the Monday after Hareth, um, spotted that. I mean, for starters, it was a black bike, but then, um, you know, then the guys were <laughs> silly, but they were, like, trying to hold the garage door down, warming it up with, instead of carrying on like normal. So they were, I'm like, what are they trying to hide? <laughs> you know? So then I get some pricks and go, oh. you know, the engine mounts are in a different place, which means different engine, doesn't it? And you can't run a different engine, so it must be next year's bike. And... Uh, that one and uh, maybe a couple of other things that I said on the live, the PR guy there's let me know that they're not happy. Um, okay. So more and more the screens are up. But then you've got to resort to, even if you can't see, you can see them go to the toolbox. So what tools are they getting and what are they working on? Ah, you know, and then you see a shock on the bench. Oh, they just changed the yeah. shock. You know? like, so I don't know. It makes it harder, but... It's the game. It's my job to tell you guys what, what they're doing, and uh, they don't. The thing is, I asked, I asked another manufacturer, uh, would you be mad if um, if I spotted that you had a new bike, 2021 bike, at an official test? And they're like, if you bring in a bike to an official test, people are going to see it. There's nothing we can do. Yeah. You know, If you don't want people to see it, you take it to a uh, – a private test, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. and that's I, the way I see it. I think what you need to do is get a whole lot of the team shirts. And then, like, when you when they're hiding something, you just slip on the Repsol Honda one and just kind of stand there <laughs> with the mechanics. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you think Alberto wouldn't spot me? <laughs> like, wear a, wear a mask, you know? Alberto, are you having time? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, um, so much. it's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Everyone has gone absolutely crazy. So much to the point that we are being begged here and without lack of having dog shit in a black bag put on my doorstep, we have got to set up an interview with you uh, at the end of the year again to talk about 2022, cool. please. I've got your email address, so we'll we'll hook that up towards the end of the year because people have been blown away. I've been blown away as a fan. I love what you do. Don's been blown away. It's been amazing. Thank you all, your family for us for taking out two and a half hours of yeah. your time. <laughs> yeah, and, um, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely chat soon and just keep doing what you're doing because, like you said, the first year was a struggle. We won't, we won't lie. But since Please, then, right. we have come on to love you. We absolutely adore you. And this, in many ways, was a dream come true. And I've interviewed a lot of people. Me and Don have interviewed a lot of people. Everyone on the side is commenting that this is probably the best interview they've ever heard in their life. So thank you oh, so much again. Awesome. I really do appreciate it. Hey, it's like the Brett, me saying nice things about Brad Pinder, isn't it? You're just, you're going to get up. I'm going to go and you're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> 
seriously. Seriously, it's been my pleasure, really, being, being able to just chat freely with you. So I really enjoyed. Um, I Thank will you. look forward to the one at the end of the year. Hopefully there's lots of developments. There will be MotoGP. So uh, talk to you then. I'll wait for your email. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. And uh, enjoy what's left of your evening. Enjoy your supper. And again, thank you to the family. Thank you to you. And, yeah, all the best going forward. Cool. See you soon. Bye, everyone. See you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Hey, thanks, man. So, everybody, um, thank you so much for joining in. Don, how awesome was that, Don? That was, that was fabulous. It's like two and a half hours. I mean, Titanic was three hours, and it felt like it was 20 days. This has been two and a half hours, and it's like, I feel like we're just 10 minutes in. It's like I've got a list of questions here, and I must be honest, we're only about a fifth of the way through them. I could talk to that guy. I mean, we could do like a 24-hour marathon talking to that guy. So, yeah, and he's so cool and so laid back and so chilled out. And, yeah. Uh, what an, what an awesome guy. Yeah, I know. That, that was fabulous. We'll definitely get him on um, at the end of the year. We'll get him on as, as often as we can. We don't want to overkill it. But I think end of the year we'll get some good, valuable information. Um, so, yeah, look forward to that. Again, big thank you to everyone for, for tuning in and supporting us. Carry on supporting us. Subscribe to Motor Rider World because if there's no Motor Rider World, this probably won't happen. So support myself, support Don with the bike show because, yeah, like I said, if we don't get the support, we can't make this happen and I need better internet apparently. Again. Yeah, your internet is starting to go now. You're a big blur. Well, Actually, you're way better than you as a blur. <laughs> well, it's two and a half hours. You can't do so yeah uh yeah thanks everyone okay. again and we'll definitely chat soon thanks Doc.